Yeah, he was grimacing. That's not a good sign. Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone, to the Boulder County Board of County Commissioners on April 23rd, 2019. All three commissioners are present, and we are here for a land use hearing on docket DC-18-0004, the amendments to the Niwot Rural Community District and land use code provisions. We will begin with a staff presentation and then open it up to the public hearing and then have the board deliberation. So take it away, Dale. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Dale Case with Land Use Department. And as you state, this is docket DC 18-4. And this is a continuation of the public hearing you held on March 12th um, of this year. And there was specific direction given um, to further investigate as far as the regulations and the land use code. And we're gonna go over some of that direction and, and proposals as we move forward here in a brief presentation. I'll do the background summary of the revised changes and any staff recommendation and give time for you to ask questions and of course public hearing and public comment on input. Um, so at that March 12th hearing, uh, the, the, thing, the pieces in the bolded information are what you had directed staff to look at, investigating the interplay between floor area ratios and lot coverage, floor area ratio analysis and ramifications at the different floor area ratio levels, potential incentives to increase the allowance for floor area ratio on parcels, um, some clarifications to the parking requirement and how much of a reduction parcels were eligible for, uh, deciduous tree landscaping language, uh, looking at the impact second story windows have on privacy of neighbors and so forth, and helping to provide some more guidance and ability to move forward with the alley use that's proposed behind block five as we have it defined in the regulations. Just to um, remind everyone where where we are, um, Niwot Rural Community District is the area outlined in the light blue here with all the colored parcels in between. The red or burgundy parcels are part of the historic district of the Rural Community District. The green is uh, just those other parcels in the rural community district and then the regulations as they've been crafted are broken down by block with the blocks being numbered starting at the area closest to the diagonal on the north west side with one two three four five and six and there are different requirements um, looking at the different conditions that really exist on these different blocks that help make this uh, a special unique place so the overview of the floor area ratio concept, uh, we did a little bit of this last time, but um, the floor area is the, the square footage of a building above grade as we've defined it to the amount of area of a lot. And so a one, a floor area of one, uh, if you have lot coverage of 100%, it covers the entire lot. Uh, a floor area ratio of one where you're covering 50% of the lot is a two story building over half of that lot and four stories, you could do a one on a quarter of that lot. So that is the concept. It is a concept that's used in many places to help define the amount of development that occur, can occur on a lot. We proposed it because in this area we have fairly um, consistent lot sizes through the district and feel that this is a good tool that we can utilize to help um, control the bulk and massing that occurs on the parcels here. Uh, the floor area ratios that uh, the existing that we've got out there, uh, block one, that parcel there is at 0 0.5, um, 0.45. The blocks three and four in the historic district, we're not proposing to have floor area ratios as part of the um, part of the, the bulk restrictions. There is, they are also subject to historic review as well as site plan review. And so with both those reviews combined and the criteria that are involved in both those processes and the fact that there's already sort of a wider range of floor area ratios in blocks three and four, uh, did not feel that it was necessary to have a floor area ratio for blocks three and four. Block five and six, the floor area ratio proposed is at 
um, with cer certain provisions to increase that that I'll go over. And in each of those cases, that 0 0.6 allows an increase in floor area, um, the highest being the NIWAT in currently existing at 0 0.58 uh, with a floor area ratio. So it allows some significant um, increases in the amount of development that can occur on those parcels. And the lot coverage concept, again, is the amount of a lot that can be covered by buildings and structures. And this is what it looks like when you look at it from above. 50% um, coverage can look, can be configured in different ways depending on the setbacks for the parcel. Uh, and so it does, it allows some flexibility in what can occur along with the floor area ratio and allows um, that developable area to be developed and other areas that would remain open for landscaping and parking and so forth. The existing conditions on the lot coverage again uh, in the different blocks. The idea here as we went over last time was that we wanted to try to avoid creating non-conforming situations. And so the lot coverages are there to reflect that in most cases. Um, and it gives room for these parcels to be able to expand and develop to a, a reasonable amount and still protect that character of the rural community district. Um, so the interplay, the question is on the interplay that the lot coverage does not reduce the amount of development allowed. It affects that distribution on the parcel of the bulk and the proportion. So as you saw in those, that slide, it, it affects how it's laid out on the parcel. The setbacks reduce the flexibility of the associated lot coverage placement. However, they do not reduce the area that may be developed in blocks five and six, especially um, where you have zero lot line set, side setbacks. Um, and very small rear or front yard setbacks. It doesn't further restrict the amount of development that can occur. And we'll have some slides in a moment that show some of that on different parcels if you want to take a look. Um, so in tandem, the floor area ratio maximums and lot coverages, setbacks, building height, address different aspects of the development and that affect the bulk mass and placement. And they don't further restrict the amount of floor area that may be developed under an FAR of 0.6. So, with the 0.6 FAR, um, each parcel would be able to, to de develop. The restrictions would play together to help keep a lot of that character and retain that character that we see in the rural community district. Uh, you had asked for what are some of the, the ramifications of what, what does the FAR mean at different levels for the amount of development that could happen. This slide shows um, that existing buildings in blocks one, two, four, and five. So taking out a historic um, district, should be one, two, five, and six, I believe. Um, is the existing square footage of 77,573 of buildings. And with a 0.55 FAR, um, you, could get, you could have 118,000 square, 100, almost 119,000 square feet, 129,000 at 0.6 and the increase from existing, you can see in sort of that middle column there of how much each increment of allowing more floor area would, would add to those blocks as it moves forward and the percent increase at the bottom of what that would mean over existing square footage. So um, at a 0.6 as proposed, you're looking at about a 67% increase over existing square footage at the 0.7, if everybody was able to qualify for uh, the bonus, you'd be up almost uh, a 95% increase over what would be uh, allowed. So, And then property by property, it, it, you can look at some examples of, of what would be, um, what it looks like in, in the lot size. So this is a lot that's closest to the diagonal 201 Murray Street, lot size is 16, almost 17,000 square feet. It currently has about 8,500 square feet of parcel of, of structure. It, it, at 0.6, it would be allowed to increase to 10,158 square feet. At 0.7, it would be uh, allowed to increase to 11,851 square feet. And with 50% lot coverage, at the, as you go to the bottom there, it shows that if there wasn't a floor area ratio and a two-story and just along that 50%, the maximum 
one floor area ratio could be would would be sixteen thousand nine hundred and thirty square feet. So quite a big increase would could be possible without having that floor area restriction also overlaid on that. Um, the current FAR that's proposed in, in, in meeting with some of the, the folks who are interested in this property is something that, that would work for them in talking with them. So um, I think, again, we've tried to structure something that allows change, allows development, but really respects the character of the community. Um, if we go down here, you can look at another par parcel that, oops, can't get that to go away. It's not coming up. Sorry about that. We'll try and get that working and we can show. Oh, I got to unclick and then click. All right. Thank you. Old guy with technology. Sorry. <laughs> uh, at the Niwad Inn property, which uh, we've heard um, from a lot of folks through the meetings and things, is a, a property that people. Um, respect and, and like to emulate in the community. Uh, the lot size is about 14,500 square feet. It currently has about 8,406 square feet of above grade structure, 0. 0.6 square FAR. It's allowed uh, about a 300 square foot increase in structures. So this was, again, the, the one that was closest to that 0. 0.6. Currently it's at 0. 0.58. And so it allows some, some increase in floor area. Again, this parcel went through a, a pretty extensive development review process back in the 90s, and these were the numbers that were that came out of that review process um, for what was appropriate for the district at that time. Um, and so this would even allow a little bit of an increase over, over that. Uh, I don't know if there's other parcels we can click on. We have this map at the end too, but to highlight some of that interplay and what it looks like and familiarize yourself with those parcels. Um, one of the things that you requested was us to look at if there was any mechanisms for people to be able to ask for an increase or a bonus in the FAR over what staff had proposed to 0.6. Uh, staff has drafted language that's in your packet of a couple of opportunities to do that, of increase from 0.6 to 0.7. Uh, if the applicants transfer an equal amount of square footage from another parcel in that same block, it can be approved through that review process, provided it meets the criteria that are listed down below. And this is to address, uh, I think one of the, the, the exhibits that was shown during the public testimony showed uh, a parcel that was they wanted to be able to move some of the development up closer off to Second Avenue, and that would not be possible under the current FARs. And it was really taking development away from the parcel next to it, and FAR away from that if that was to occur and so this would allow that to happen it's not to the same staff's not recommending going as high of far as that proposal was requesting but this would allow some of that maneuver maneuvering of square footage amongst parcels and since it's a ratio you're still getting the same overall development um, intensity on on that block it's just where and how it's happening on that block, uh, giving a little more flexibility as to that, and hopefully it would keep some of that development away from the residential um, um, neighbors on the back as well by doing that. Uh, and then the other piece is an uh, increase in floor area ratio from 0.6 to 0.7. If all the residential square footage that's on a, on a, on a project would be above the commercial, um, or restaurant to retail uses. And so again, one of the things that we've heard through the process is people value the residential above the retail. Uh, they really, um, there's, there's been more negative comments about having residential separated from those, those structures. So um, trying to keep the focus of the district on that commercial, retail, restaurant type uses um, and have that, re uh, give some bonus then for the residential being above, still allowing for residential um, development as that is something that uh, I think we all also feel is necessary within the district or appropriate within the district. Uh, and then the other piece is looking further at the historic district and treating properties consistently throughout that is there is the one parcel um, at the corner of Franklin and 2nd Avenue where the Terra restaurant is that's in the historic district. 
And so that is in block five, but not having a floor area restriction on that. Again, it's going to be heavily controlled by the historic regulations in that case. It's going, it is limited as to the location of the house, the Bader house that's on that property as to um, how much development could happen on that parcel without it impacting that historic resource. So the floor area restriction wasn't seen as an absolute um, necessity in that case and treating it like the other um, properties in the historic district seems appropriate. Parking requirements, we clarified this section so that uh, there were some questions whether that 40% that we talked about was the cumulative or whether people could go above that with different uh, mechanisms are allowed. And we just want to make, sure, make it clear that that it was 40% was the maximum parking reduction that would be allowed currently if, if, it, if it could be met. Uh, deciduous tree landscaping came up. That was language that was there at the beginning beginning of the district as it was created um, when there were still single family residents there, uh, residential there. And the idea, I th think, at that requirement at that time was that people wouldn't be planting big uh, big pine trees to block views and, and not make the street as pedestrian friendly. And so we now are just proposing that it's a recommendation that people don't use those types of trees. Um, it's probably not even necessary with all the other landscaping reviews we have, but uh, we left it in there as just a recommendation so that people, again, if they're reading it, they would know that we're going to be looking at, at um, other types of landscaping other than, than that. Um, and really, we're going to be concentrating on things that are low water and better for the environment in any case. Uh, the other piece was looking at the privacy of the neighbors that live behind some of the commercial areas. That, again, that transition zone is incredibly important as you move from the commercial to the residential and having um, some controls in place to maybe help some of that privacy concern that we heard about. Um, so we have something drafted in the code that we would look at window placement specifically through a site plan review process as something came in. It's not a prescriptive limitation on windows or window placement in those cases. Um, I think it's gonna really de depend on the design and layout of the particular building as to whether or not that would be something that would be controlled or needed to be mitigated through a review, but just puts folks on, on notice that it's something we're concerned about. Same with um, patios on the back, outside decks on second stories and so forth. Um, some of it with the increased setback on second stories to 25 feet, some of that we feel is mitigated through that requirement already. Um, but a glass wall or a glass house on the back side is something I think that we would, we would look at very carefully as it came through the review process to try to respect those neighbors' privacy. Um, same with the proposed lighting requirements as they come down on the neighbor, the residential neighbors, um, trying to, again, do something that we often do through site plan review, through our, our code, through a review is limit the impacts that lights have on neighbors and have on the night sky. Um, and this again is some, uh, it's a restriction often that comes on site plan reviews as they go through our processes where we have concerns about too much light, we limit it to the minimum necessary to meet building code requirements. And that's what this, this does. Uh, and on non-conforming properties, uh, we brought this up at the last hearing as well, that there are, um, I think three that within the rear yard setback where we limit the 20, uh, you can't be higher than 15 feet within that first 25 feet. Uh, there's three parcels that are, would be made non-conforming by that. Um, those, par those buildings are there, those, their structures have existed, the impacts are, are currently existing, and so development around it that's occurred around it and that's occurred, it recognizes that impact already, and so this language is to allow those properties, if they were to need to redevelop or change something back there on that area that would be within that 25 foot rear setback um, to do so, to rebuild in a similar manner with similar bulk as is, as is existing. Um, and then another piece as we were going through looking at the, the regs after the hearing, um, we looked at uh, the 
two corner properties along Franklin. One is the property that where Colter is and the, the other one on the other corner. And the way the regulations um, currently are is the, those corner yards would have a 20 foot setback all along both corners, so along Franklin and Second Avenue. And the parcel on the, across from Colterra on that um, south side, it was built at a 10 foot setback. And so all along the frontage on Franklin, it's a 10 foot setback. And so again, kind of going, looking at some of the consistency between that block and looking at Franklin and the impacts and the, the way the corners get treated is that we recommend a 10 foot front setback along Franklin. And again, a, with the ability even to reduce that a little bit further, if you're retaining at least 30 foot setback from Second Avenue, uh, this is uh, in looking at, at that piece of trying to recognize, especially where you have historic structures you're trying to save and there's limitations as to what you can do on that parcel with moving the structures, that there's going to be an increased setback in that case. And so allowing some, some way to expand in a different direction to, to get, have an out for that. And then I will turn it over to Mike Thomas on the alley piece. Thank you, Dale. Mike Thomas, County Engineer, Transportation Department. Yeah, today uh, we also wanted to look at uh, some of the alley guidelines. Uh, the board had requested that we dive a little deeper into that, and and we had, had talked through this with uh, the residents and the business owners out there over the last few weeks. Um, one of the things that we really wanted to do and continue to evaluate is safety and pedestrian experience uh, to be considered during this review. Um, Again, we're going to try. We want to try and uh, discourage additional uh, alley, or excuse me, curb cuts or uh, accesses directly from second onto the properties uh, when possible, and uh, trying to encourage the shared access um, where the alley access is available. Uh, we do want to make sure that uh, we reduce the curb cuts, and unless it utilizes an existing curb cut, um, and consolidating them as well. Um, the commercial property owners on the alley, uh, we had looked at the study uh, concept and uh, we do agree that, that uh, we need to look further into this. Uh, we've talked about uh, the property owners, the commercial property owners being responsible to fund and prepare and then have the county accept a transportation study. Uh, this looks at access, uh, traffic, uh, pedestrian use, uh, safety aspects and so forth in this area and then also look at the associated impacts to the properties on either side. Uh, then we wanted to look at the design of the alley uh, to include pedestrian features, pullouts and turnarounds. Um, we wanted to also look at uh, uh, buffering the visibility to the adjacent properties, specifically the ones to the north in the residential area and uh, uh, making sure fences and plantings are utilized in a way that would help encourage that uh, buffering. Um, there are, there's a lot here and, and suffice to say, uh, you know, we have a lot of uh, consideration here. Um, residential properties, uh, they, they want to uh, obtain, a, uh, excuse me, if they want to obtain a new vehicular access, uh, they would also participate in the costs of any improvements to this alley. Uh, since they would have that direct access. Uh, currently, we've not been approached by anyone, uh, and there is one uh, property on the north side that does have a garage that accesses directly to the alley. Uh, curb cuts across the sidewalk, again, will be looked at reducing in number, uh, and as that study uh, indicates, uh, that those will be accomplished once the alley improvements are completed. Um, if we do look at a one-way directional use of the alley, um, then we need to consider a second access out to either Second or Niwot Road uh, in order to accommodate the vehicular and pedestrian traffic. Uh, I wanted to also address a couple of issues uh, as you look at this slide. Uh, one, one issue uh, relative to access to the alley has to do with um, uh, the public uh, availability of that alley. And yes, it is a county right of way. It was dedicated with the town site plat, uh, but it does not guarantee uh, that 
all have access to the alley for all adjoining uses since we do control access through access permits. Uh, the multimodal standards uh, in section 2.3.3.2 calls out those access permits being required for any new access. Um, we've never taken the position that adjacent property, property owners had unfettered access to or use of the alley like any other, and that's similar to any other county right of way. We do have a, uh, a require or a need to make sure that access is is controlled and appropriate. Um, no one's allowed to construct a driveway for for vehicular access without an access permit, uh, as I stated, and sometimes that requires off-site improvements uh, to the roadway or in this case the alley. Um, it's like any access, we need to meet county standards. Uh, the standards are proposed uh, to ensure, um, or standards are looked at to ensure safety and compatibility in the neighborhood. Um, one thing that we do note and has been stated before is past pedestrian use of the alley. Uh, what we've done is incorporated uh, the pedestrian use in this uh, particular uh, drawing, as you can see along the uh, right side of this uh, perspective, uh, it's a four foot uh, landscape buffer or pedestrian walkway. What we're trying to do here is indicate an area where pedestrians uh, have used the alley, not specifically in a particular location, but uh, call out that pedestrian use. And one thing to note that these are uh, schematic drawings. Uh, the coloring and, and uh, shape of these drawings uh, and the features in these drawings do not indicate a specific type of surfacing. So I wanna make that clear. We're not calling out for a four foot concrete path. We're merely trying to identify that as separate from the driving area. Um, again, safety and pedestrian experiences shall be considered during this review um, and where the alley access is available, curb cuts will not be permitted unless it uh, utilizes an existing one and or combines with others. Here's another view of this. Uh, this is a one-way configuration. Uh, no particular direction intended. It's just merely to identify that there's a, a narrower driving path uh, uh, somewhere between a 9-foot and a 12-foot driving path. Uh, we show 12-foot here as the maximum width as well as a 4-foot pedestrian walkway as well as a landscape buffer. And all of these uh, dimensions fit within the existing 20-foot platted uh, right-of-way for that alley. Uh, one other thing to look at is uh, maintenance of the alley. Uh, as was uh, identified in the alley study from 1997 was a, um, or excuse me, 96 was a, uh, a maintenance aspect and that uh, any maintenance that is be performed on this alley in whatever condition it is uh, requires a uh, permission from the county as to what type of maintenance is performed and uh, who is to do that. Uh, the county may own the right-of-way, but we do not maintain it. We have never accepted this alley for maintenance. I'll turn it back over to Dale. And that concludes the staff presentation. And if you have questions, we ask that you move forward and approve the land use code text amendments and we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for Dale or Mike at this time? Um, yeah, I had um, one, I think, mostly for Mike. With the alley study, it wasn't, I mean, we got a lot of comments obviously about the alley and um, it seemed like I was kind of unclear about what we, hope to accomplish in the study um, and then the time involved with that? Yes, uh, the what we're trying to accomplish with the alley study is to determine the impacts of the surrounding roads. One thing that became clear uh, as folks talked to us about this was uh, the impacts to Franklin uh, Street there on the uh, north, I guess northwest end of the alley. Uh, if we are going to be moving traffic onto the alley, there is going to be a, an increase in impacts to traffic crossing into onto Franklin as well as into the alley from Franklin, and that has an impact on pedestrians as well as other traffic on Franklin itself. 
Um, the timing of the study, uh, we've tried not to put a, a time limit or a time frame on the study because we want to make sure that uh, we look at it thoroughly. Uh, I know there are concerns about it uh, pushing out farther and farther to to uh, alter um, the time frame of these improvements, uh, but we we do want to work with this and work with the the commercial property owners to come up with a, a as quickly as possible a study that will identify what needs to be done out there. So you're saying the onus on doing the studies with the property owners, and so then the timing is really incumbent upon them to decide when they're going to do it and. Yes, and, and like with all development, uh, we uh, have certain standards that we want to see and uh, information included in those traffic studies to ensure that we're looking at all the uh, components of the project. So, so okay. yes, it is incumbent on them as to how quickly that can be done. And we wouldn't do it somebody else. They would contract with somebody else, but we would want to create a template for what that looks like. We, we would work with them on what that template and what the information looks like, yes. I think that's it for now. Perhaps later. Okay. So why don't we turn to the public hearing then? I think you all know the the deal, but just in, as a refresher, um, we when we call you up, you can come to the podium or you could sit there. Please start by stating your name and address for the record. And the lights will guide you. Green, begin. Um, the green light will flash when you have a minute left. It'll turn to gold when you have 30 seconds left. And it'll go to red when your time's up. And we would ask you to um, please conclude at that point. And uh, some of you have pooled time to have some extra minutes to speak. And we'll begin with those folks. So we'll start with Mary Kuntz, who has six minutes. She's pooling with Maria Wells. Um, followed by Ann Postal, and then Pat Murphy. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. My name is Mary Kuntz, and I'm both a resident and business property owner in Niwot. My address is 6604 Birdcliff Way. As you know, the moratorium began as a result of disconnect between the Third Avenue neighbors adjacent to the alley and a project on Second Avenue. Let's begin with the positive results of this moratorium. At long last, the alley issue has been discussed. Since the 90s, the alley has been a contentious problem. It was a great relief when you all determined it was simply good planning to use the alley for access to Second Avenue properties where available. But although you directed land use to come up with a solution for this use, the new suggestions are so financially onerous that the use of the alley for commercial properties will not happen. It's a simple alley, not a roadway. The suggestions by land use align more with suggestions for a city street than an alley used for access. Very disappointing and not at all the intent of your directive. If allowed to simplify the alley standards more in line with communities surrounding us, Second Avenue properties will be able to come up with more creative and desirable designs that create pedestrian friendly and inviting spaces that all of Niwot may enjoy. They may incorporate historic buildings into their planning and maintain the Niwot charm we all expect. We believe this is what you had intended with your directive. So after seven months of moratorium, the alley issue is still muddy due to its lack of affordability. Next, although the real issue was use of the alley and setbacks on Block 5, the suggested code changes by land use encompassed not just that area, but the entirety of Old Town Niwad. By designing code changes that attempt to resolve the issue for Block 5 and applying these to the rest of Old Town, Land use has hamstrung NIWAT's future and kept us in 1995. NIWAT has potential gateway projects in blocks one and two, as well as the southeast corner of NIWAT Road and Second Avenue. By instituting these proposed code changes, these areas may not develop to their full potential, therefore holding NIWAT back. While the residential population of NIWAT service area has increased dramatically, the Old Town Business District has not. It's only two blocks. You have to all remember this. It's only two blocks. If you don't grow, you stagnate. The nature of business is to change and adapt to changing societal needs and markets. The BRT is coming to Highway 119. Wouldn't it be great to have services for commuters along that route? Might they be more inclined to use it if there are services available? 
We ask that you consider focusing on Block 5's alley and setback issues and leave the rest of Niwot Old Town as is. Many of the existing properties have historic structures, including Block 5, which will naturally limit their size and development. Instituting one size fits all code restrictions like FAR and lot coverage only limits the ability for developments to be more creative. Some of the developments currently planned include micro retail spaces, which would be more affordable and much desired by the community. Porch Front's project at 102 Second Avenue has plans for these types of spaces as well. I had not planned to bring our project up at this hearing. However, I have re received information that despite the fact our project was approved prior to moratorium by both the NIWAT Design Review and HPAB, land use has come back to tell us our massing is too much and we need to re redesign to fit the new proposed regulations. Why did they remove this historic district from the moratorium if the plan the whole time was to hold us to the new regulations? Was this a political or PR move to appease the residents and allow Colterra to move forward? Land use is now requiring us to limit our project despite the fact that it is also a gateway to NIWAT. Redesign is their directive at our expense. Through NIWAT Design Review, HPAB, and proposed community involvement planned by land use, NIWAT is more than capable of guiding sustainable and appealing development. As David Sags noted in the last commissioner's meeting, NIWAT isn't broke, please don't fix it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up, we have Ann Postel, who's pulling time with Jill Whitner, Jim Postel, and Liv Lisa Rivard, and you'll have 10 minutes. Thanks. Good afternoon, commissioners. I'm Ann Postel, 8392 Niwot Meadow Farm Road in Niwot. Do you remember a month ago when David Skaggs told you that Niwot wasn't broken? Back in September, we weren't. That sure seems like a long, long time ago. Jump to today. Today, Niwot is horribly broken. So who was betrayed by this process? Well, we can start with Niwot citizens. A quick look at the support versus op opposition map that we just gave you paints a very clear picture that the vast majority of Niwot citizens don't want these proposed changes. You received hundreds and hundreds of pages from NIWAT citizens who are overwhelmingly against the proposed land use code revisions. Boulder County has not acted in a manner worthy of trust. NIWAT citizens have been clearly betrayed. So how about the NRCD business property owners? Boy, oh boy, have we been betrayed. It began in 2012 when we gave away our right to vote for changes to the land use code with the promise that giving up our voting rights was just to ensure that NIWAT businesses would have the parking that they required. Yeah, right. Here's a quote from Denise Grimm from the July 31st, 2012 County Commissioner hearing. Quote, we are removing the requirement that property owners vote on revisions because if parking becomes a problem again, we may need to go back and amend them again. And we don't want our hands tied with trying to get the right number of votes, end quote. You can listen to this in two different public hearing recordings. As property owners, we sold our soul in exchange for parking. We were assured that there would, of course, be an active public participation process. We thought that that meant that our opinions would matter. Boy, were we wrong. We were betrayed. Yes, we were naive and stupid and trusting, but we were also shamefully betrayed. Today, you will find not even one NRCD1 property owner who has come forward in support of the proposed regulations. Forget about trying to get a majority vote. You don't have one. Yet we're looking down the barrel at these overreaching and extreme code revisions. Our voice is ignored. Boy, oh boy, betrayed. We can't get, forget the current Second Avenue merchants who have seen restaurants and brew pubs leave Niwot, Colterra's return delayed indefinitely, our foot traffic disappearing, our hotel rooms left vacant, our remaining retail stores and restaurants struggling, betrayed. Even though you exempted Porchfront from the moratorium and they have unanimous approval from the Niwot Design Review Committee and HPAB, 
The exemption just forced them to pay for architectural services twice, once according to the previous rules, now again under the new rules, appallingly betrayed. How about the comprehensive plan? Rather than allow the NRCD to provide the goods, services, and employment opportunities we need, the proposed rules will ensure that a drive to Boulder or Longmont will be regularly mandated. There's another group in Niwot who's been betrayed. The Third Avenue residents have been totally betrayed. About seven months ago, you were approached by your land use staff with a story about a crisis on the border between Second and Third Avenue that required a moratorium. Land use had two primary goals with this moratorium. One was to drastically downzone the adjacent commercial properties. The other was to codify for eternity that the alley behind, behind Third Avenue would never be used by the commercial property owners. For decades, the Third Avenue residents have been told that the commercial property owners were never to be allowed to access the alley they shared. The Third Avenue neighbors took land use at their word. The problem is that their word was both illegal and bad planning. Regardless, the neighbors trusted in the promises made by the land use department and have been betrayed. You can even count in Niwot's Local Improvement District Advisory Board. The LID Advisory Board sent two resolutions to you against the moratorium and against the proposed code revisions. Both were completely ignored with no response. Betrayal with a capital B. There is at least one more group that has been betrayed. This group has three members. And a month ago, those three members gave land use very clear direction. When directed to promote a safe and inviting pedestrian experience on Second Avenue, land use responded by promoting a safe and inviting pedestrian experience for the alley. When directed to allow alley access for Second Avenue businesses, land use responded by making alley access a financial impossibility. Financial impossibility. When directed to provide incentives to increase FAR for projects that provide community benefit, land use responded by killing Niwot's gateway projects on blocks one and two, and by downzoning the remaining projects in blocks five and six below financial viability. It is possible that what seemed to many of us as very clear direction morphed into something, some other direction in the last 30 days. That would partly explain the massive disconnect between the direction given and the proposed regulations we see today. Betrayed, maybe. So where are we today? It's pretty clear that a whole lot of damage has been done. Can trust ever be reestablished? I don't know. You can't solve everyone's betrayal, but you can respond in a trustworthy manner. You can do the right thing. Your direction last month was correct. The alley should be opened up and used by the Second Avenue businesses. The curb cuts on Second Avenue should be eliminated where feasible. The commercial property owners have presented a reasonable solution for both. It should be followed. A number of the proposed code changes are overreaching and extreme. They are not supported by even one and our CD1 property owner. We're not against all of the changes, but some of them are truly egregious. Listen to the property owners. You assured us in 2012 that you would. If we hadn't been deceived in 2012, we would not be here today. So throw out all the new, unreviewed, shoot from the hip restrictions that magically appeared last month. They can be handled through the SPR and design review processes. Get rid of FAR as a requirement. I challenge you to find anyone who can walk down Second Avenue and come even close to identifying the properties with the highest or the lowest FARs. FAR is a foreign language. Allow the review processes to do their job. And if you want to know what our community wants, check that map. The 25-foot rear setback for second floor space is unfair. If we were zoned residential, we could have our second floor pl placed 10 feet closer to the rear property line. You're forcing us to go from a zero-foot required setback to a 25-foot setback for the second floor. Match the setback to the second floor that is allowed across the alley. If you do this, no second floor windows could be closer than 50 feet apart, 50 feet. 15 on one side, 20-foot alley, 15 on the other. That is enough. 
Blocks one and two should have the same restrictions as block three and four. This is a no-brainer. This is our gateway from the diagonal. It's time for our county government to govern in a manner worthy of our trust. Stop the betrayal, end the moratorium, let NIWAP begin the process to repair what has been so extremely and unnecessarily broken. And since I have a little bit of extra time, that study that's being proposed, minimum $50,000. Minimum $50,000, I talked to Matt Delich, no commercial property owner is going to pay that. $50,000 for the study, that's not for any of the improvements, that's for the study, that we have no idea whether it's a one-way or a two-way. Not gonna happen. The developers have left. David Meisner doesn't have a partner anymore. I'm gonna go forward with my project without alley access, so the, there will be at least some people who won't feel betrayed. But it's a bad idea. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Pat Murphy, who's pulling time with Mike Selleck, and we'll have six minutes. And after that, we'll have Biff Warren. I don't know if I can follow Ann. I'm very simple on what I'm going to say. <clears throat> My name is Patricia Murphy. I live at 9051 Comanche Road, and have lived there for over 45 years. I have been a realtor, business owner and a commercial property owner for over 30 years. I also own a home adjacent to the alley in the historic part of town. I have been involved with the county on the NRCD zoning changes and been in the NIWAT Design Review Committee since its beginning. I'm just going to give you a little history. <clears throat> One of my biggest dreams was to help create senior housing for our aging population together with Ron Stewart, Celine Hall, Chris Kanowitz, and Boulder Housing, Eagle Place was built in the center of town. Have any of you ever seen Eagle Place in downtown Niwot? It's by the shopping center. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The development could have been much more dense on the property. However, it was not built to the maximum. And today emits the essence of charm of the town and will be timeless. The project is one that the county and local citizens can be proud of. Hopefully, Second Avenue will be the same. It wasn't developed to the very max and it keeps the charm and people love how it looks. I understand the issues. I'm, I'm a realtor and, and frustrations of developers who expected to, to develop their property to the maximum as current zoning allowed. It was the intent, I believe, from many meetings when we were making the NRCDs to have the second block less dense. But that was not spelled out, however, so it was just a misconception when we were having all the meetings. However, all through the years, most of us had, have had to compromise some of our property rights for the benefit of the whole town. For examples, the homes in the Niwak Community Service Area are, are subject to a presumptive size of 125% of the medium square footage. People have had to tear down storage sheds because of this issue. So our, some of the property rights have been taken away from people that thought that they could build a huge house, and that's been changed. So they've had to accept that. This is especially true for the neighbors in Old Town. The re residents have had a, a park created, a park created, a concert venue, and a parking lot, all of which were rezoned around the Old Town, which was in part, yeah, I can't, imparted, impacted their property values and rights. But it was for the good of the town. We have a beautiful park. We're going to have a parking lot. And, and so everybody compromised because some of the houses across from the parking lot, some across from the park, have lost some value. But it was for the better of the town. So sometimes we have property owners expect something from property, but maybe for the whole of the town, we have to lose a little bit. And I understand that as 
a realtor, and I understand that for Anne also. Residents agreed to add density on an ag property to receive TDRs. I was on that program. And I proposed, yes, let's accept that. Now I look in, I used to look into a field. I look into huge homes out of my window because we agreed, agreed for the greater good of the community, we would surround Niwa with open space. So some of us have to look at the big houses for the better of the community. I received many calls regarding how people love the feeling and charm of the town, and I know you can't describe that. To keep the qualities of the town, I feel the density of the build-out should be carefully thought through. Niwot is a rare place these days. Help us keep the charm of the town by looking at compromise, maybe, between neighbors and developers regarding density, curb cuts, and alleys. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Bruce Warren, then Brad Langdon, and then Tony Satelli. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Bruce Warren, sometimes Biff Warren, mm -hmm. same person. 7321 Dry Creek Road, Iowa, Colorado. I've been a resident and a business owner uh, for 45 years in Niwot. Um I have not been able to participate in this process to the extent that I would have liked as I'm still recovering from a, a unwelcome stay in the hospital. Uh, but I'm back now and I'm, I'm a few hours a day, so you get my few hours. Um, I'm a LID member. I have been since the inception of the LID. I was also on the Transportation and Connectivity study group back in 2011 and 12. And I have to say that I went back and listened to the tape, the tapes, planning commission, county commissioners, when that proposal was made and approved. What a difference, what a contrast. This process is so different and so flawed compared to that. And I ask you to consider that. Um, back then, part of what was done was to take away from the NRCD property owners the right to approve any changes. They had a system, they have a system in place that's worked for 25 years. There are review processes there, and it worked. All of a sudden now, we start out with first a moratorium, then all these changes, then in more changes, and then this week, I get in my email at about 4 o'clock on Wednesday, a whole nother package of proposed changes. And those are not red lines, so I can't easily figure out what they are. And there are things in there that they did not talk about. There's a proposal about if you have residential, you can't can on on-street parking. Nobody's talking about that. Nobody's had a chance to look at those. Back when we did the connectivity study, we had a committee. The LID recommended it. We put people on it that were citizens. We put business owners. We put residents on it. And we worked with the staff of the county to come up with a proposal that had a consensus. Nobody showed up at the Boulder County Commissioner's hearing to speak, only Denise Grimm. I and Carrie Wise were the only ones who spoke at the Planning Commission hearing for that, because it was a consensus. You don't have that here. You don't have that at all. And just because they gave up the right to approve changes doesn't mean you shouldn't consider their support and getting their support. I don't think you have it in this case. Back then, the purpose was to simplify. This is, my gosh, so complicated, it's hard to imagine. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Brad Langdon, Tony Satelli, and Elaine Erb. So before I begin, um, I'd just like to say how nice it is to see Biff up and around. I think practically everybody in this room is a, a friend of Biff, so nice to see you, Biff. My name is Brad Langdon, and I live at 283rd Avenue in Niwot. <clears throat> 
And today I'm here mostly for education because I don't know what's appropriate for the commissioners to do when it comes to the agenda of interested parties and what the approved system for off the record contact is with you. So I'll ask that question in a moment. What I think I know based on what I read on the internet is from the Colorado Constitution Article 29, Ethics in Government, which states under the heading Purpose and Findings. A, Section 1, the people of the state of Colorado hereby find and declare that A, the conduct of public officers and members of the General Assembly, local government officials, and government employees must hold the respect and confidence of the people. B, they shall carry out their duties for the benefit of the people of the state. And C, they shall therefore avoid conduct that is in violation of their public trust or that creates a justifiable impression among members of the public that such trust is being violated. Here are my questions, and I have copies uh, to hand to you if you want them afterwards. One, can a member of the public have an off-record meeting with you to discuss their specific agenda? Two, for the record, did any or all of you have contact off the record with parties who agenda, whose agenda is to incorporate NIWAT? Three, and as much as you are our legislators, are <clears throat> such off the record meetings appropriate? And four, when people hear that our legislators have had off the record meetings, if that occurred, with parties who are pushing a specific agenda, do you think that that creates a justifiable impression that you have violated your oath to support the state constitution and the trust of the people who you've been elected to serve? So look forward to your comments during um, your comment period. And then additionally, I'd just like to correct a misstatement that was made earlier that seems to continue the moratorium did not begin as a disconnect between Second Avenue business owners <clears throat> and Third, <clears throat> excuse me, and Third Avenue residents. And um, I was there when it was first suggested. If anybody wants to talk to me about that, I'll tell them how it started. Thank you. May I? Sure. Thank you. So Tony Sintel Sitelli, Elaine Erb, and then Cornelia Saul. Good afternoon, commissioners. Tony Santelli, 8622 Skyland Drive. Uh, Nywit resident, 22 years. Restaurant donor, 14 years. MBA president, 12 years. Leadership's a lonely place when you're in a situation you're in today. I, uh, I feel for you. You got a tough situation. I'm here to just cheerlead for one thing, and I've been cheerleading for it as a president of the business association. I felt that a walkable <coughs> Second Avenue is good for business. And I've been cheerleading to try to get us all to agree to follow your direction. The curb cuts independent of what's happened for the last 20 years. It's not good business policy. And we've got the property owners to agree at their expense where possible to eliminate those curb cuts. So we're in a situation where if you have alley access, all the other good things can flow. Now alley access should be handled judiciously. The privacy of the residents is important. Access to the businesses is important. Maintaining drainage is important. But imposing other requirements which create a cost prohibitive alley study just puts us in a situation where we can't move forward. So you're in a difficult situation and I respect that, but leadership is a lonely place and you signed up for it. We have a once in a generation opportunity to make NIWAT a walkable oasis for the next 50 years. It's a tough decision. There are lots of constituencies. 
Thank you for your time. Thank you. Elaine Erb. And then Cornelia Sol and Laura Skaggs. Hello again. Uh, my name's Elaine Erb. I live at 7955 Countryside Drive in Niwot. It's actually right by Eagle Place. So, you know, I've been in town a long time. I've lived through us figuring out, like, where do we put a development like that? And I remember my first reaction of, oh my gosh, I'm going to have this property right next to me. Well, it's actually been kind of endearing. OK, I don't like the dogs barking, because our property doesn't allow dogs. But you know, this is the nature of change. And to me, we need to be open to change. Uh, Niwot's a cute, great place to live. I've been there over 30 years because of that. A lot of the local business owners know who I am and my husband because we are people that walk around the town, bike around the town. I drive as well, but you know, I'm really into active transportation. And this is why I have been involved in this process. I really believe that improving the quality of developments that are in town can help make Niwot better. I feel like the process has just been, it's been kind of mind blowing because I, I felt personally insulted by planning commission who acted like the people who spoke to them had zero experience, even though I have a master's in urban planning and I do planning for a living. So when, when they look at that and the developers and say, you don't know what you're talking about, as they say, it's just, you know, it's rude and inappropriate. And I, I have a lot of faith in the developers that we're talking to today. And th this is what heartens me is that, you know, when NIWA was being built when I was there, the developer at the time was somebody who just throw up any buildings he could. They weren't always of the best quality and really wasn't in it for the quality of the town. We also just need to remind ourselves, Second Avenue is our commercial district. Our code even talks about that. So having those amenities in town is, you know, it's part of what makes Niwot special, having the ability to have artists, small business, you know, all that Anne has done for the town has been really great. You know, what she's done to help make First Fridays. and. You know, when people like that are treated as poorly as they have been in this process, it breaks my heart. So I think it's important we remember Second Avenue is our commercial and transportation hub. You know, we got founded as a railroad town. So let that area develop. And I don't think we're there yet on these, the current proposals. I don't think we're making it financially possible for the businesses. And I never walk on the alley, so <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So Cornelia Saul and then Laura Skaggs, and then um, that's all we have signed up, so anybody else in the audience who wants to speak, we'll give you an opportunity after that. Hi, I'm Cornelia Saul. I own the Niwad Inn, 342 Second Avenue in Niwad. I also have a home there, live there. So I feel NIWAT has been successful at curtailing change or development on Block 5 of NIWAT. They have made it so difficult that business people and investors are walking away from their projects. They're selling their properties and giving up, and are giving up. Bob Van Neshen is one of these people, David Meisner as well. At this point, they're just trying to unload their property. When Bob was planning on developing his property next door to the Niwad Inn, I talked to him several times about putting in a bakery on his property. I had already lined up an incredible baker and was formulating plans. I think the citizens of Niwad would have thoroughly enjoyed a bakery there, but now that'll never happen. A dentist office eventually is going to go in, which is fine, but I don't think it, would add, it will add as much to the charm of Niwad as a bakery filled with delicious treats. Land use has also been successful in, in completely blocking the use of the alley once again. They've decided to put 
unlimited expenses on the five commercial property owners on that block, creating a high-end alley that is way beyond any other alley around with landscaping, a pedestrian walkway, turnarounds, drainage, plus a required traffic study. The business owners who are supposed to pay for all this would have no control on how much it would cost. Land use would spend that would, anyway, five business owners would be burned, burdened with the expense. We are not trying to use the alley to improve our businesses or increase sales. We, are only, we only want to protect people that walk on the sidewalk, sidewalk in front of the businesses. I have seen and been told of several near accidents that have happened to pedestrians on the sidewalk. One was just two first Fridays ago. A delivery person for lefties came racing into the driveway, not even stopping or slowing down for the pedestrians that were crossing the sidewalk in front of lefties driveway. The pedestrians had to, luckily saw him and stopped to avoid being hit. What if the, this had been children? who were unaware of the car coming in. Land use obviously does not place importance on the safety of the pedestrians as they continuously find ways to delay the use of the alley. I feel a traffic study is totally unnecessary. It's ridiculous. All we have to do is count the par parking places behind the businesses to know how many people will be using the alley. Thank you. Oh, I just have one more. Well, I just can't afford. I'm out. I cannot afford the alley. So as far as my commercial business is concerned, I can't partake in that. So I guess we won't be able to use the alley. Thank you. Laura Skaggs? Commissioners, my name is Laura Skaggs, 7428 North 73rd Street, Longmont. I so regret having to speak again about the package now proposed by staff for the NRCD. I believed we left the last meeting with the hope that we might be able to work things out, especially as you, the commissioners, directed staff to deal with the alley question. How disappointing to receive the latest staff proposal, which seems to have totally ignored the spirit of compromise that was supposed to inform their work during this additional month's moratorium. Others have commented about the last minute piling on of completely new restrictions in the building form section, and about the misguided transformation of an alley plan from practicable to one-sided impossible. All this leaves me dismayed and disillusioned. The new staff proposal bespeaks an arrogance of power that is unbecoming, a staff that is supposedly subordinate to the elected representatives of this county. Aren't you angry? at their disregard of your instructions from the last hearing? Over the years, many of us have resolutely explained and defended the efforts of this commission for the future well-being of the county, even as those plans were at times controversial. But this latest presumed authority of the land use staff is indefensible. It must be a wonderful career opportunity to be vested with the powers of the planning staff in this county. But for those powers to be legitimate, they must, they must be exercised consistent with democratic norms and community consent. There has been some progress worth note over these months, defining mixed use, parking relief, initial acknowledgement of the legal common use of the alley, Yet, it would be a fundamental denial of any notion of due process to adopt the latest staff proposal today. 
better to go back to the beginning, lift the moratorium, and I say this with trepidation, rely on the authority of prior regulations to determine what can and cannot happen in NIWAT. To adopt a proposal before you, a proposal invented by staff despite your instructions, would be to default on your official supervisory responsibility. Thank you. Thank you. So that's all that we have signed up. Is there anybody who hasn't spoken or pulled time who would like to have the opportunity to comment to us? I see, see two in the middle, so come up. You can arm wrestle over who gets to talk first, and then when you're done, if you could sign up on the clipboard, that'd be great. Hi, I'm Victoria Keene, 285 Third Avenue, and I'm not good at speaking off the cuff, so here we go. <laughs> um, I'm kind of confused by all this in a lot of ways because we came here um, based on a comment uh, that Anne and the uh, business community su submitted about the alley traffic study must have clear directors and requirements. These include, number one, moratorium is ended. So we were, we were coming in saying, okay, yes, let's end this moratorium and then let's proceed with figuring out the alley piece. I mean, we realized that, that we have lost the alley argument. That was our compromise. So, um, so I'm a little bit confused by this um, in that respect. <laughs> uh, and then I, I understand what Ann was saying, but I don't like people putting words in my mouth or our mouths. I'll talk about my mouth in particular. <laughs> um, Anne was saying that uh, Third Avenue has been betrayed. <clears throat> and personally, by land use staff, I personally don't feel that way. I feel like it's really been an interesting process. I've learned more about this stuff than I ever wanted to know. <laughs> but I feel, you know, well informed now. And I knew that there would be compromise. Um, and I felt like we had, we had reached that, that we lost the alley argument, the alley's gonna be opened up, okay, um, but then we, we got the setbacks. So I don't feel betrayed at all. You know, I've learned a lot. Um, we've been mad at times, uh, losing the alley. I mean, we, we practically had a wake in the neighborhood about that, but you know, we've accepted that there's gonna be changes in the alley. And I think it's great that, this, that they're gonna be high standards and I think the higher the traffic volume is going to be, the greater the standards need to be. Um, because I've lived on the alley for 35 years, and I've seen all the awkward alley moments, you know, the, the moving vans parked in there for four and a half hours. The other day there was a uh, Western Disposals truck that broke down uh, right by Southpaw that was in there for about an hour and a half. Um, I've seen, you know, like, the tree pruning trucks have been parked in there for like three days surfacing, you know, some of the adjacent properties. So there's a lot of issues with this. There's a lot of ins and outs that people don't realize if they don't live on the alley and see it 24 seven. And I think those can be worked out, but I do feel like the standards uh, have to be pretty high. And we use the alley as a cutoff, as a, you know, we walk in the alley. <laughs> so I guess that's it, huh? All righty. Uh, you've got a few more seconds. Oh. I guess until it goes red. I think I'm done. Okay. <laughs> Thank Fair you. Enough. That that works too. Sorry. Hi, I'm I'm Catherine McCall. I live on Third Avenue, and I just briefly want to say a couple of things. The first thing is, can you hear me now? Yeah. That's good. The first is to support Pat Murphy in her saying that people should maybe stop think, always thinking about just themselves and think more about what's good for the whole town. And I think, despite a lot of protestations from all kinds of groups that they've got the, the best um, future for NIWOT uh, in, in, their, in their minds. They actually have their bottom line in minds. And I think her comment about compromise is really important. Nobody on Third Avenue has ever been against more development on Second Avenue. We just want to see the development that is done be done properly and to, to um, complement the nature of Second Avenue, which is, as other speakers have said, a commercial district. We want to see more commercial building, well done commercial building on Second Avenue. Um, but unfortunately, up till now, most of the developments we've been seeing proposed are not commercial, they're residential, rental residential. That's what I personally um, find 
upsetting. I think it would, you know, it would destroy the character of, of Second Avenue if we end up with Southport type condos from one end of the alley to the other. And although I'm pretty agnostic about the alley, I live on the other side of Third, so I don't have any kind of immediate effects of extra lighting or traffic. Um, I regard the the use of the alley and thrashing out a compromise on the use of the alley as a way to direct and control the kind of development that happens on Second Avenue, which I think should be more on the lines of things like the Slater Building, which is um, commercial um, entities below and small residences above. Um, so any kind of any kind of regulations which encourage that, and I'm heartened to see that that Dale's Group have um, increased the potential far that a developer can have if they're prepared to put in that kind of development, more commercial and residences on top. That's what fits, that's what looks good. Most of the buildings people like, like the Slater building, that's what they are. So that's, that's the kind of development I'd like to see, and I'd like to see discussions of the alley use be slanted in that direction. How do we support that kind of development? Does it, it should stay as a service alley, you know? You've got res, um, commercial properties all along second, they can access it for for deliveries, for trash, for utilities, as they already do, and also for things like staff parking and for a limited amount of residential parking for residences above commercial developments. So although I know there's been lots of kicking and screaming about you know Third Avenue beastly people driving off developers, I have to say I am not sad to see um, Vons Colorado concept disappear because the only plan I ever saw from them was for basically a suburban residential rental subdivision on the gateway to Niwot. I don't think that would have helped anybody. It certainly wouldn't have helped the businesses. What's, you know, how, how are more rental residential units gonna help business in the commercial part of Niwot? So that's my 10 cents worth. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else? Yep. Good afternoon, my name is Dave Snow. I live at 301 Third Avenue right behind Osmosis. And I just had a couple of real quick comments. First of all, I too was, would echo uh, what Kathy just said about the increasing FAR as an incentive to put more uh, businesses there makes good sense. It makes good sense to draw people downtown and it, putting the uh, living units upstairs on the second floor is a good idea. It, it just keeps that business property business, which I think is really good for everybody downtown. Uh, and then a, a couple of quick notes on the alley. Um, you know, I too will echo Victoria and say I know that that's a battle that we're on the other side of at this point. Um, I'd just like to say, you know, business hasn't been prohibited from using the alley. Uh, as a matter of fact, there are people who use it daily in and out. And it's, my understanding was that it was um, they were trying to keep traffic from going from second to the alley and out to Franklin. But if you go from second to a parking lot and you stay there and work all day and you go out the alley, that was just fine, was my understanding. So I think a lot of that is uh, kind of uh, confusing hype to me. Um, regarding the alley study issue, um, there's been work done on the alley that resulted in the alley draining onto the residential property and it's been raised maybe 12 to 14 inches which makes all of our privacy fences just that much shorter um, my point being that if you just go along and you put asphalt and you put uh, road base in the alley that that doesn't deal with those kinds of issues. And I think it's important to have somebody who knows what they're doing look at the alley and decide what, what things there are that need to be addressed with it. So I'm certainly in favor of that. And of course, I'm very much in favor of making sure there's some sort of a, a buffer between the competing uses. It's, it's hard backing up to business in a lot of ways. We have garbage trucks dumping beer bottles at 10 o'clock at night or, or the people from the restaurants and um, anyway there's rights on both sides of the alley and I think it's important to mitigate each other's impacts on each other so that's that thank you thank you anyone else all right thank you we'll close the public hearing and turn
the matter back um, for any final staff comments. If you want to respond to anything you've heard and then questions from the board. Sure. Cup, cup, Dale Case again, the Land Use Department. A uh, couple quick responses, and Mike may have some on the alley pieces too, and I know you'll have some questions. Um, I think just process-wise, we heard some comments about the process and, and people feeling betrayed through that. Um, I think what we have tried to do is try to hold public meetings, take public comment, read through the public comment, discern the different issues that have come out of that, and try to look at the different land use impacts that, that are occurring in the area and what the intent of the rural community district was, is and craft regulations that fit what that intent is and what we were hearing from the community as a whole. Um, I think painting it as for or against the regulations is really difficult when you read through the comments, and I know you all read through them all. It is, there's issues raised, there's people for certain things and against certain things in the regulations. Uh, we tried to look at the idea of compromising things that we balance those land use impacts. So um, the FAR, the structure requirements are things to help um, address that rural community character that is important to what NIWAT is and also help address some of the impacts on those neighboring residential um, um, folks. The regulations also do a lot to loosen up parking requirements that make it a little bit easier for development by loosening up the parking requirements. In the past, that parking would have had to occur on site basically and that gives more land for development by not having that, that parking requirement if you don't have the FAR or other restrictions in place. So it's a balance of those different pieces of loosening parking, not requiring as much on site. Uh, how, how are we gonna control the bulk and massing of the buildings on those structures so they still fit with the character? The tools that we, we've been running by the community and been working with folks on are the tools that, that we've presented moving forward. Um, we've tried to take into consideration the different needs. Um, we've modified setbacks uh, and, and so forth through the process and come up with a set of regulations that uh, I think allow change to occur in the district, change that is even more than what we have allowed through the site plan review process in the past in most instance, instances and really tries to uh, address those issues. So um, I think if there's any any faults with the process, I'd, I'd love to hear from folks as we move forward. So as we debrief this, I we can do it differently next time. Um, but uh, that was the attempt and that's where staff is on, on that. And I'll let Mike, if there's any things he wants to clarify. Uh, nothing specific. Uh, I know that there's some concern about the scope and the cost of the traffic study. Uh, certainly that can vary. Uh, the name that was given for a potential uh, professional to do that is, is well known by our department. So uh, I do understand uh, where they're coming from potentially. Um, but we do want to make sure that we do have a, an alley that is uh, usable, an area, not just the alley, but uh, Second Avenue, Franklin, the alley, and other aspects of this area, uh, walkable, usable, safe, and, and appropriate uh, in its use. Uh, you know, certainly the alley uh, issue is, is a concern in terms of its current condition. Uh, is it usable? Uh, is it appropriate in terms of its scale, uh, the drainage is an issue, and we want to make sure that that drainage is, is dealt with appropriately. Uh, there are some uh, physical constraints there that need to be dealt with appropriately. Uh, and so there, it, it's a complicated issue, but we do uh, feel that we can work through it with the commercial owners. Questions? Yeah, I had a couple. Thank you. Um, on um, can you talk about blocks one and two again and what is happening with the it's and what's being applied there sure the blocks one and two have um the far and lot coverage restrictions like blocks the, blocks, the same as five and six block, like block five and six now um this lot here that i've highlighted in red is it actually extends outside the district um so the parcel is larger 
we have said that we will count the whole parcel size as part of the FAR calculation, which we've done in the charts. And um, even though the business and commercial uses can only happen in the RCD1 portion of this property, it's not really shown here, but the parcel goes further this way. Um, the the lot coverage and size allows for, um, at 0.6, allows for expansion from 8,465 square feet to 10,158 square feet. Um, I did meet with the uh, couple gentlemen who were looking at acquiring this property and doing the development. Uh, we went over what they were wanting to do, and it was doable, easily doable, actually, within the 0.6 FAR and the lot coverage restrictions. Um, when they left, they they thought it was that was okay and it would work for them for for what their project is. Um, the same with this lot, and I haven't heard about this any redevelopment proposals for this lot. Uh, the existing structure is about 3,300 square feet. With a 0.6 FAR, you'd be allowed up to 4,439 square feet. So, has some some ability to grow. Um, again, as that gateway property on that side. And do they they'd still be eligible for the same incentives? If correct. They, correct. If, yes. if they wanted to, the um, okay. The I guess maybe the. The bigger questions I have are about the alley study. And um, I mean, I have to agree that my vision was simpler than what's come out with what's being presented to us today. And it didn't seem like it would be quite as involved. And maybe you could point me to exactly where we're talking about in the, I can scroll through here. Sure, it's under the access and mobility section, page A8 of 23. Um, Not page eight, but page A8. A8, A8. On, under the regulations. A. Describes those design guidelines. I keep going, how far, 23? Page 17 of this. 17. Page. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't have the same page numbers. Within I mean, I appreciate the fact that we need to do it correctly, but we, I mean, we, I don't think, I think Matt has been there subsequent, but when we met with the LID um, last year, and then, you know, we walked along 2nd Avenue, and then we walked along the alley, I think that's when it became at least pretty clear to me that, you know, it would make sense from a lot of standpoints to use the alley as access for the businesses. You could close the curb cuts on 2nd Avenue and whatever traffic needed to happen could go up and down the alley. And um, you know, it was clear too that there were some encroachments in the alley, that there was some fixing that maybe needed to be, that probably needed to be done um, on the actual road base of the alley. Um, but I'm not quite sure that involves um, a big traffic study, and I'm not sure that it involves, I mean, I'm just concerned that A, of the cost and the scope, as folks have talked about, um, we're not trying to build a big road here. We're trying to make a usable, safe alley. Certainly. Um yeah, I think you have some good points there uh, regarding the scope of the alley study. And, and there's not been a lot of talk about the exact content and scope of the alley. There are some things that are in the proposed regulations that do talk about certain elements that should be considered. Uh, but, you know, we've not had a, a, a good discussion or, or conversation with the commercial property owners, the LID, or anyone in terms of what that exact scope would look like. Uh, I know that that we've made comments uh, in, in public forums recently that uh, have stated we want to make sure this is done right, uh, but we've not gone into any detail as to what right looks like. 
And uh, I'm certainly willing to reduce or, or right size the scope to make sure that A, the study is not onerous uh, or B, cost prohibitive, but also make sure that it, it does address the issues that have been brought up, uh, particularly by the residents for uh, pedestrian safety as well as uh, the type of use that's there uh, in the alley or proposed in the alley. Have we done or ha we probably haven't done uh, an alley study ourselves because there wouldn't be a circumstance in which we were owners of an alley or anything. That but is correct. Are we familiar with um, alley studies that have happened other places that we could look to t as a idea for to give give us an idea around scope and cost? Yeah, I, we certainly can do that type of research. Uh, we've not looked at those specific elements uh, to date, but uh, we can look at other agencies. Uh, I'm not I'm not particularly aware of what one would consider an alley study. I think we're looking at uh, traffic studies for different uses, and yet we would need to tailor it for this type of use in the alley. So we can look at other agencies and find out what they look like. So maybe that's, um, sorry to belabor this, but it seems to be like an important point. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, so we have, as an agency, have done traffic studies or, or um, contracted with folks to do contra traffic studies in the past. So a traffic study is, the cost of it is determined by the length of time, the length of road, the length of, I'm trying to find some way we could correlate yeah. what we know about traffic studies, because we've been engaged in those, to an alley study, knowing that, or presuming that an alley study mm -hmm. should be less costly than an actual road study. Mm -hmm. Well, I think really the, the issue here is to look at the scope of what it is we're trying to do. I don't have anything that we can scale to understand what that exact cost would be because we have not, when we do a traffic study for a, a roadway, for example, for an intersection, there are a lot fewer and different details that are involved in that than there would be for something like this. How much does um, something like that cost, though? Uh, it would depend on, on the facility. I, I'm i frankly unable to answer that question at this time. I really am. I don't want to venture a guess because I don't want to be completely way off base either either way. I'm not, and, and believe me, I want to answer your question, but uh, when the quote from uh, Ann, as far as the cost of the study by Matt Delich, uh, who again is a well-known, respected traffic engineer uh, in this area of fifty thousand dollars, you know that may seem like a, a, a likely cost, but I don't know what the scope was that was presented to him. Uh, it may have been taken directly from uh, the proposed. Regulations. It could have been taken directly from our multimodal standards. I just don't know. I was not a privy to that that conversation. If I could just chime in, I guess what are we trying to learn from the traffic study that would cause us to change? I mean, it, alleys are historically used for for access points for the businesses. We know how many property owners there are. I mean, we don't know the exact nature of businesses, so that could change somewhat, but. I guess, what would cause us to do something different in the alley that would necessitate the, the study of, of this magnitude, of this level of detail? Mm -hmm. Would we decide that, oh, nope, we're wrong, we don't want alley access? It wouldn't be that we would make it wider, mm -hmm. so what would change? Well, I think one of the things is, that, you know, we're talking about a 700-foot dead-end alley, so certainly that's a limitation that we have and, and a abound on that scope. Um, what we're talking about is how much traffic are we moving away from these curb cuts, either all removed or partially removed, and transferring into the alley from Franklin? What kind of impact would it have even on the intersection of Franklin and Second? Uh, would it change anything? It may not. Uh, what kind of impact are we looking at on cars now going down Franklin, crossing a pedestrian use on Franklin into the alley? What kind of conflicts are we So I get about that. There? 
what would we do differently with that information? Would it cause us to put in a crosswalk on Franklin? Or, I mean, would if it wouldn't change the fact that we're going to open up the alley, then it's information, but it wouldn't actually dictate a change. So that's the part I'm trying to understand. Right. And, and would it, it cause us to not open up the alley? Are you saying with a certain amount of not, traffic, it would have to be no, two no, way? I think that would I mean, that would be a decision we make on either two way or one way alley, um, based on circulation. But that's what the traffic study would help with: is what would be better, a one way alley, a two way alley? Um, how much traffic? If it's one way, how much traffic are we talking about coming back out onto Second or Nywater or somewhere else, so that we can anticipate that type that type of activity? And if there's some sort of a pedestrian safety feature that we need to incorporate, that would help inform us as to what that feature would be. Again, I don't know what those would be in terms of a physical alley. We don't need a study to determine if we want to how we want that alley to look. Um, there you go. Right. <laughs> And, and that's, what that's we fine. <laughs> if, if, okay. And, and I'm sorry for dancing around that answer. That, that wasn't the intent. But my, my point is, is that there are other elements of this that we've also been asked from the residents and others in that area that, okay, what does the data tell us? Are there safety issues already that need to be mitigated that you're only going to make worse or whatever? Uh, those are the types of things we wanted to evaluate. So the physical alley, I, we don't need a study for that. Uh, the it's how we how we interact with pedestrians and traffic that are have now been relocated to a different pattern. So I have another question: whether or not it's possible to do um, car counts ourselves. I mean, I know we have the technology to mm -hmm. to measure traffic levels. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering again, um, in an effort to move forward. Um, mm -hmm whether or not it would be possible to move forward with physically opening up the alley, main, uh, keeping track of traffic levels, and then if there's a problem in the future, then taking action in partnership with residents and property owners to see what, what would be appropriate. Um, but using our collective experience of, mm -hmm. of what the traffic levels are in the alley to guide that. Right. I'm thinking, you know, similar to how we do with par the parking lot uh, issue in Niwot. You know, we have triggers that cause us, and we study periodically to see if there's an issue that would cause us to do something. And mm -hmm. or, Anyway, I'm just mm -hmm. trying to brainstorm on whether or not there's a way to move forward in a simple way. Mm -hmm. I don't want at all um, take lightly any concerns about pedestrian safety anywhere, mm -hmm. but I'm just wondering if we're hunting for a problem that doesn't exist at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, there are recent development uh, uh, projects on 2nd Avenue that have taken place that give us existing data already that we don't have to duplicate. Uh, but the, we could take that into account and then see if there's anything additional short term that we might need to augment. But yeah, yeah, we can look at um, I mean, we step could by put step counters at the end of the alley uh -huh. and because we have those uh -huh. and then we could do them right away and then we could improve the alley that need whatever is the simplest thing to do that we feel like we need to have to do and because we don't need a study to do the alley uh -huh. and then if the counters change six months from now after the alley's done then we can decide whether it's in an unsafe place or not and then put up a pedestrian something or other mm -hmm. we can certainly do that so uh, when I went out there and looked at the alley and drove the alley in a lower clearance vehicle it does not drain well in parts uh, it was pretty sloppy and uh, to the point I'm like whoa you know so there are real issues I think that need to be addressed perhaps you don't do the full-on study but <clears throat> you want this alley to function we had public testimony about that very issue about the drainage into the residences and you, you want it to drain well mm -hmm. for a number of reasons. Um, so I guess <clears throat> I don't know where the sweet spot is on this, but I would want to uh, not want to underdo it either if we're going to open up access and potentially create problems for other people mm -hmm. with that. I mean, there, 
that seems like an engineering design, something that would be figured out during engineering and design, which wouldn't require a study prior to doing the engineering and design, right? That is correct. Okay. And just to be clear, I guess I wasn't envisioning this being a paved alley. For, for what, well, not necessarily. I mean, whatever engineering and design needs to happen. I mean, something would happen. Right, some, a change in some service, but. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. No, it does, when we walk down it, yeah. it, you know, it, it's not paved, and neither is the other one. I don't think. Right. Um, it needed to be graded. There's yeah. huge, but mm -hmm. I'm not sure that. Anyway, are there um, other questions? I, I had a few more questions of Dale. I have a couple. Should I jump in? If you'd like to. Okay. So I have, I have questions around the FAR and. Uh, I've been trying to get my arms around that and how, what that means <clears throat> and currently what's happening so I can have a reference as to what the growth might be. Uh, right now, if there weren't a moratorium in place, somebody wanted to make a change, they'd have to go through a site review process. Is that right? Correct. And we've had buildings and owners do that. Um, uh, when Niwot in, there was a proposal to be bigger than it was, if I understand, and there was pushback in the community and it came out to the size it is in. Can you give me a little bit of background of this, what happened there and how they got to the size they got to? Yeah, so the, I think that's an example of the site plan review process uh, as it played out in the 90s with a project that initially came in the door and was uh, uh, over 20,000 square feet of proposed structure. Uh, it was not um, oriented along 2nd Avenue. It, the main building ran perpendicular to 2nd. Uh, the facade of it, the shorter facade faced 2nd. It had residential in the back with garages right on the alley. Through the process and through interactions with staff, uh, the project was redesigned multiple times um, because of concerns raised with how that did not meet the character of the rural community district. It was over intensive. Uh, it was lower, it was made smaller as a proposal and, uh, after several months of back and forth with staff. That came back and staff issued a staff determination as we do in, in site plan review, a director's determination. The, um, still a lot of comment about the bulk of that structure, especially the height of it then. It had been reoriented along 2nd Avenue, the building face, uh, but there was, it was a flat roof and so the facade going three stories up uh, was very much a concern. Uh, there are comments from some of the business owners, the property owner, the Slater building next door, the Niwa Business Association with the bulk and size of that structure. That project then, once it Director issues a determination, there's the call up period. If there's neighborhood concerns, those neighborhood concerns prompted the county commissioners to call that project up for a public hearing. That public hearing then uh, ended up being tabled at the applicant's request as they redesigned their project. And they came in with a subsequent application a month later for what be, what is was approvable and was approved as the NIWAT in at about 8,500 square feet above grade. It's, uh, I think, uh, almost 11,000 square feet total with the basement, but uh, much different process, a much different project than initially came in the door. A lot of back and forth with staff, uh, with the neighbors, and with the commissioners uh, calling it up for a public hearing. Part of, again, what we're trying to do here is set that predictability up front. So where we know there may be limits to what could be approved or what's approvable in the area, um, not not having an expectation that there, there might be a lot more approved. It's similar to what we did in 2008 with the presumptive house size around the county is people could assume they could build a 100,000 square foot house, come in our door and be very disappointed when they found out, well, we're gonna approve a 4,000 square foot house and they didn't have what they felt was the guidance or that direction. Here, we're, again, we're trying to come up with a framework and a set of regulations that gives and sets that expectation to something reasonable. So it sounds like a pretty contentious process, was it? 
yeah, I think any of those processes, especially when you're doing them one by one in an area like this, is contentious, and it raises uh, the, spect the specter of both each time you were going through a process sort of similar to this with the neighbors having to come out, staff, and the applicants making proposals. And the Slater building is a larger building. Was that similar? It was similar. It went through before site plan review applied to the district. And so it went through um, some design regulations through the building permit process. And again, trying to keep that, that building off the alley, keeping a pretty large rear setback so that the residential neighborhoods, you'd have that transition area of the parking behind the building. The parking had to be accessed off 2nd Avenue, both these um, projects because of the alley study and because of that policy we implemented back then. So those were some of the key issues on, on those. So how big, uh, from an FAR perspective, are those two buildings? Yeah, the uh, let me go this. So, the Niwad Inn is, uh, again, it's 8,406 square feet from an FAR perspective above grade. So it's about, I think it's a, close to 11,000 square feet total with their basement. Um, and the Slater building is 9,594 square feet. And it could still, with a 0.6 FAR, uh, their much larger lot, could expand still all, all the way up to 11,173 square feet. Uh, and even with a bonus, if they expanded to the side, if their access came off the alley, they'd have some room on the side there where their access comes in off 2nd Avenue to maybe expand that way. And they might even get up to the 0.7 by keeping the residential above any retail and commercial if it was approved as staff has proposed. So but my recollection, the bigger of the two from an FAR perspective was there was 5.8. Is the Niwad Inn, yes. Yeah, Niwad Inn. And then going to this. 0.58. Pardon? 0.58. 0.58, sorry. Going to table number one that talks about what F, each increment of FAR there is uh, for each half, for half a point. So the 0.55 to 0.6, each one has about 11,000 square foot increment. Is that correct? For the total developable for the block. For each areas. increment of 0.5? Yeah, I think so. 0.05? My, my point is, is that for every 0.05 we add from in blocks 1, 2, 3, 5, and 6, we add 11,000 square feet potential. Is that correct? It, it depends on that, so, how big the lot is. Well, I, I think what, no, I'm what just you're talking, talking about, Commissioner Jones, is the total square footage that's per... Um, on all the blocks that would be allowed with the FAR. And yes, for each 0.5 increment, the total square footage for the RCD would increase at that, that increment. For those one, two, three, five, and six altogether. But it's also interesting to me uh, that there was another slide you had earlier that talked about what increments. And again, I'm just trying to figure out what an FAR look, this looks like. And so, each additional half point would be a building bigger than the Slater building. Added to the district. Right. Yes. If, if, if all the, if every parcel built to the maximum right. FAR within the area, it'd be like adding another building the size of the Slater building for each half. And if you went to 0.7, it's 95% increase. So it would almost double. If it was all built out, what is there now? Correct. And the 0.6 would increase it by two thirds. Just to clarify, that's district wide. District wide. That's, that's district all. District wide. I, I'm just trying to get that's a sense. The four of blocks the scale involved in the F FAR of what we're approving, because I, you know, an FAR is kind of an abstract subject to me. If I can compare it to a, if I if I can compare it to a uh, a building, I get a sense of it. So. Um, you, and to double, I get a sense of it. That's a lot to me. And, and I guess maybe to, to clarify and put a, a finer point on the FAR and why, again, it's, it's, it's a ratio. So it adjusts for the lot size. Right. So it's taking into account and allowing larger buildings on some of the, the larger lots. 
whereas something that is just a uh, straight square footage limitation would not take into account any any differentiation in lot size and buildability. And so, again, within this area, this feels like the correct tool to use to help address the amount of development on a parcel. Sure, and I, I don't disagree with you. I agree with you. And But I'm just trying to get a sense of what we're talking about approving. And the point seven could potentially double the amount of property in Niwot on those blocks if it, they all built out. That's a lot. Uh, Two-thirds is a lot, the point six. And that means everything along there would be of the scale of the Niwot Inn. Um, and I, I, I appreciate you trying to bring some parameters to this, but just looking at this the site plan review isn't giving any more than 0. 0.6 now, or at least historically it hasn't. And so uh, we're talking about going to 0. 0.7 now. And that's for the biggest buildings on at least block five. So it just, I don't know, that's the scale. So I appreciate your answers of those questions. I had a question about the 0. 0.7 um, incentive on how many properties would have be able to avail themselves of that incentive. Do you have a sense of that? So or, it, any of the parcels right now, because they're all under the 0. 0.6, would be able to avail themselves to that. Um, so yes, it, it, they'd have to then go through the site plan review process and meet the criteria in order to get that approved. So we'd still evaluate whether a parcel could have that 0. 0.7 or somewhere around 0.7 based on the review criteria, but any of the parcels right now seem like they could qualify. I had, I, I was surprised by some of the comments. Um, and I think at least a couple of folks suggested that there were a lot more changes that happened between now and our prior hearing that you all did not bring to our attention. And I'm just curious um, what you think those comments are referring to, and if you want to just you bring them to light. Matt left. Do we need to wait? Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, I don't think so. Go, go ahead. Okay. So the I think the changes that um, you know from reading the comments that were submitted and and so forth, those changes were um, around the lighting uh, requirements and the window um, additions to the design guidelines. Those were the main ones. Um, Yeah, the, the articulation and the, of the roof forms and the back patio balconies, second story balconies. And those were to address uh, concerns again, like the windows that, that you asked us to look at with privacy for those residential neighbors. Uh, again, I think we um, put it in as a guideline of something we would look at through the review process, uh, not as a prescriptive requirement because we, Staff feels that as we've drafted the regs and with that requirement that second stories be set back 25 feet, um, we do think that's going to address many, many times that's going to address the issue um, with windows and patios on that backside. But if somebody were to propose a full glass wall on the backside or something like that, it just gives us that ability to, kind of, to look at that and makes people aware as they're doing their designs that um, to be thoughtful, I think, of their neighbors. and. The people on the other side of the alley, but I think those are the changes that uh, that we were direct to look at. Um, I think with with trying to get things out and get them out for public comment, I wish we would have been able to do so sooner. Um, so that was an issue. But JC yeah, Serda, Assistant one. County Attorney Dale, can you clarify? I believe that some of the comments that were made, both in written form and maybe perhaps today, regarding new. Um, parts of the code, they were actually previously included in the past staff recommendations, were they not? 
So for example, I think one was roofs should conform with the existing roof styles on Second Avenue within the same block. I believe that was in the prior was, one. Right, that is a, that's a con consistent And with the past. I believe that the expanses of building facade on any side was also on the prior staff recommendation letters yes. and the proposed language. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so I just had one question about um, that balancing out concern for the neighbors on Third Avenue and trying to keep things simple um, with regards to the window placement in the patio language. I'm just wondering if we can simplify that and just um, deal with that issue with through site plan review that our goal is to minimize impacts to the adjacent residents without going into a specific level of detail. Do you think we would accomplish roughly the same thing in terms of the goal of protecting the residents? I know we directed you to come up with something, mm -hmm. and I'm just wondering yeah. if it's more detail than necessary, or if we could, anyway, I've asked. I, I think we could be more general, and that would be okay. My worry or fear is that um, if the issue is around windows and, and second story patios and things like that and we don't mention that that five years from now ten years from now when none of us are sitting here well, except commissioner jones i guess maybe um we um we we don't have that context and and that evolves so but at the same time i think these are things that yeah these are ideas for how to address that concern of the privacy can we do it in a more general way, yes, we can. Could we do it just with their neighborhood character criteria that we have in site plan review? Yes, but this kind of calls out and puts a finer point on the fact that the issue has been raised by by the residents. Yeah, and to be clear, I wasn't suggesting removing it altogether, but just that design, whether or not we just say the goal is to minimize impacts to the Third Avenue residents through window placement and, and patio use, and then how that, I'm, again, I'm yeah. not, I'm just trying to think if there's a simpler way to get at that. I, I think that we could come up with language like that without being specific as to. But, but I, don't, I don't see, other than those, I don't see a whole lot. I mean, encouraging rather than prescribing deciduous trees didn't seem to be like a big change. Um, so and I'm just trying to look for the direction as well. That, that yeah, exactly. So we are. Um, are there other issues that you of uh, questions that you want to address? No, no. So we're sort of moving into deliberation now. So let's call a spade a spade and do that. Maybe we could just offer up the issues that in general where we want to focus or if we need to focus. Deb, it looks like you're ready to start. Sure. The, um, well, thanks again for everybody taking the time to comment and send in their information. Um, I think that the, generally speaking, I'm in favor of moving ahead with what we have except for what we've talked about and that I agree with Elise that language needs to be simpler and less prescriptive. And then this discussion about the alley, I'm not, quite sure what to do about changing um, what you have in the draft language to get to where we just had the discussion that there, we don't need to have a study to do the improvements on the alley that we need to be able to do to use it um, for commercial business uh, and to eliminate the curb cuts on the front of the properties. Um, so I'm not quite sure what all needs to change in the code there. But other, those are the only two changes, right. what we're looking at now, that I'd, otherwise I'd be fine to move approval. I would, I would appreciate knowing what we're talking about from in, in uh, Amendment A, which is actually the ordinance. I'm sorry, say that again? I just... These are pretty broad general suggestions we're giving to staff, and I'm just trying to figure out what we're talking about in the actual uh, amended code. Where, what page? Okay. And I think we're talking amongst ourselves at this point to sort of put on, okay. in general, where are we and what, what areas do we want to have further conversation about changes and that kind of thing. 
um, the issue of outdoor lighting and um, is on page A10 of 23. And thank you, A10. And then the patios, patio language was near there, if that's what you're referring to, Deb. And then the parking study was... Um, 17. Is A8 of 23 or page 17 of the packet. So would the suggestion be to staff that they simplify that or strike that or language or? Well, I think that was my question. I'm not quite sure. So maybe. Um, but, but before we get into that, what issues do you want to deal yes. with? Are you? Okay. I have another one. OK. Um, and it has to do with the FAR. Uh, the status quo now, the thing that's not broken, as far as historical review of these, has been under 0.6 FAR. And sounds like it was highly contentious when it was getting close to that on Block 5. And I know it's a while back, but that's the status quo as far as mass that people were willing to accept collectively through this process then. And I, I, I don't want to have that happen. I, I, just the disruption to the community this is happening is a problem, in my opinion. And so I want to provide more certainty up front so people know what's going on and then they can work within that. And for me, the points going to, I like the idea of a bonus, but going to point seven, which potentially doubles, could double the, the area, is a lot. And so I would like to keep that at six five. So six to six five for the bonus because I do like giving an incentive to have residential above board and protecting deciduous trees and that kind of thing. I think that's worthy, but for me, that potential is big. And when you think of what has transpired through a lot of angst, uh, seemingly, uh, in the community to get to below six, uh, I think that we are, that's probably where people are willing to accept to a site plan review, that range of size. So I would just change that 0.7 to 0.6 on page four at the bottom of the page. So you would suggest no incentive, FA, FAR system? Yeah, so, so the way it would read is block five to six can propose an increase of FAR of six. To a maximum of seven, I would just say six five, maximum six point five. So Matt, may I ask a clarifying question because sure. I'm not understanding the doubling thing that you're saying. If you're looking, like say up at that table up there, yeah. and so at point six, the increase of square footage over um, what would be currently allowed is 51,995, is that correct, Dale? Or maybe Jose, Jose's. Mr. FAR expert. Um, and so if it were to go, if you were to get an incentive, you then if everyone were somehow able to get an incentive, which I, I don't think is even possible because if you've got to take square footage from one property to another, there's no way they all could go to 0.7. For that increase, for the, that that one, if they all yeah. built residential above commercial, yeah. that's possible. Then but that would you're be correct. So there's the, still a cap of 0. 0.6 FAR for that other. Yeah, but generally speaking, the very most that it could change would be from 52,000 to 73,6. So that's 25,000 square feet. So I'm not understanding what would double from 0.6 to 0.7. I'm just looking at the percentage at the bottom, percent increase from existing, that's all. But even that's not double, because one is 67% and the other's 95, doubling from 0.6 would be 130 something, 40. 0.7 is 95% increase. 
from what is current, I think what right what from what is current. Yeah. I'm just trying to get my arms around what that means. And twenty, what is it, two thousand? That that's almost three nine watt ends. I mean that that gives me a scale and a sense of it. That's a lot. That, that's why I think point six makes more sense, giving it a bonus, but not to the point seven, based on the fact that there was a lot of contention in this community on two properties that came in under six, under point six. And that's, that probably would be where we end up if this came through again, is my guess. But I wanna avoid that. I just wanna say, you know, this is a scale you can grow. Yes, you need, there needs to be room to grow, but you know, keep it to a reasonable level. So, um, and before we wrap up FAR, on the parking study, are you also heading in the same direction as Deb? Uh, yes, although that's pretty vague to me. Okay, well, well let's wrestle it to the ground. I, I, I um, it seems like a lot to ask. At the same time, you want it done right and uh, not have to come back and revisit it. Okay, I wanna just put some general comments on. Um, and I do, do wanna thank everybody who's been um, in this room and again and again and engaging with us. I am a little bit surprised at the tenor of the, the comments. Um, and I appreciate the Third Avenue folks saying, we lost the alley, we compromised. Um, I feel like that is the spirit of what we're doing is compromising between different values and trying to get to that sweet spot where I think Pat Murphy probably said it best, you know, doing what's best for the community. Um, so I think w w the parts that could get sweeter um, are the ones that um, we've, we've flagged. In particular, I think we need to scale back the alley study. I think the priorities around that, if we back up, we want to get rid of curb cuts on 2nd and Avenue. I think Tony's talked about that walkable pedestrian experience that's safe that, that, um, that we're trying to achieve. We want to provide access to the alley, but in a way that's respectful for the um, residents. And so what's the minimum um, to allow us to move forward, meet those goals without adding a whole lot of cost? And I guess the way I would do it is simplify it and add additional requirements over time if traffic becomes unsafe or levels feel too much. Um, I think in terms of level of investment around improvements, I wanna make sure that we're buffering the residents. I think that's a priority. Um, and if there's drainage issues, then we'll, we'll need to, to fix that. But I'm not seeing a super um, intensive roadway. I don't see it even being paved. And I think we, we can achieve this through a simpler means. Um, the, the language around the, the um, windows and patios, I guess I was just looking for opportunities to uh, achieve the intent, s clarify that we want to protect the residents, um, but leave some creativity on how that's done without prescribing that. And it, the, in those two places, it looked like um, it, maybe we could um, state the intent and, and, and not be too prescriptive. And with regards to the FAR, I think it, uh, having sat on the planning board in the city of Boulder when they went over there through their FAR fight, I, it's tough. It's hard to visualize, but it is an important construct to really um, uh, get at the relationship between buildings and the lot size that I think is important to preserve. Um, I guess it tr in terms of trying to keep in the uh, peace in the village and compromise um, I'm, uh, I could probably live with the staff proposal, um, but I'm also under the impression that, like the question that Deb said, that we're not likely to get to a scenario where we're gonna have full build out at 0.7 FAR. Dale, you're, you're doing math down there, so correct me if I'm wrong, but because it's very unlikely that every property is gonna redevelopment with redevelop with residents on the second floor or be able to trade FAR. So to max out everything at 0.7, 
one of those two things would have to happen, right? Yeah, every, everything would have to have residential above yeah. the way the staff's written the, the language. So, and I, I do think, you know, generally getting to those maximums is less likely, so. And I just want to clarify the relationship between site plan review and the FAR that typically when you go through site plan review to make adjustments to, for particular use, building size massing, that um, refines these requirements in some way. So it could be that in order to get an appropriate building that's within character, it may be that through site plan review, you don't max out because there needs to be changes to make it an acceptable character preserving building. Exactly. This is the maximum that would be allowed in the district, and it could be further reduced or altered through the site plan review process. So I guess I'm getting to the point with the FAR. I hear what you're saying, and you're right. I just don't think that that maximum stat is going to reflect the reality for those three reasons. That site plan review will necessarily modify it down. That's the cap. If things like character can be met. Um, and I don't think all of the buildings are going to redevelop with residential on the second floor in order to take advantage of the incentive. And they certainly all can't trade for the FAR and another property. So, uh, and I understand that. I'm talking about the potential. So what you're going to have is instead of the 0.95, you're going to have the 0.81 or the 81% or instead of 95%, you're going to have 81% or... 60, two thirds increase, uh, and that's still a lot. That that that's my point. I get that that's not going to happen with the current rules to the 95 percent, but it could be 81 percent for sure, and that's my concern. Um, and the other thing I was going to mention, uh, Mr. Langdon talked about ex parte conversations the city attorney and the county attorney left but we didn't we don't do that and this is a quasi judicial hearing like a judge judicial and so, so we so this actually is, just is not, not it's it's a legislative normal land use dockets around a specific property are i didn't talk to anybody that's my short story and, and I, my does anybody in Iowa want to incorporate? I haven't met them yet. My my comment about incorporating last time, it was like, boy, this sure feels like I'm in the city and not the county. That's where I came from, just so you know. I don't want that hanging out there. Um, and I do remember Eagle Trace going in when I lived in Cottonwood, raising, raising my daughter there. And I thought, what a great place for seniors, soon to be one myself or M1. Uh, because for the same reason, it was a great place to raise my kid. You could walk over to Abel's and get a slice. You could go get your groceries, all those things. So I do know that, and I really respect the character of that community, having lived there a couple of years. Um, but I, so I'm not sure. Is that sufficient direction to staff to come up with? Well, no, I think no, we're just uh -uh. okay. No, we're just we're just trying chatting. to get on the same page. And so and let's dive deep. So JC has some comments to make. I can tell, and. Um, probably about what kind of direction we need to give or what could happen after our comments. I would suggest if you want to make changes to what staff has proposed in order to be able to be done with the moratorium and approve that docket, we need to be as specific as possible. I think that is very easy for um, the lighting. You know, we do have lighting requirements in our code currently. We could reference those. Uh, specifically, I think it's Article 7-1600. Um, we can be more general in our language based on what you would like to see for that language for the patios and uh, the windows. And we need to nail down what you want to do with the FAR. And in terms of the alley, you are welcome to craft what you would like to see in terms of the alley study um, versus what other requirements you believe are necessary for it to move forward tonight. So I'll chime in on the setbacks. I'm fine with the setbacks as they are. Um, if, I don't know if you uh, want to change any of that, but <coughs> I think they're thought through. They haven't changed a whole lot from the first proposal. Uh, and the changes were based on some feedback we got, so I'm fine with that. The alley, 
I think maybe we need to modify. Yeah. So why don't we talk about the alley first <laughs> then and changes that we would want to make. Page 17. Right. Or A8 of 23, depending on if you're looking electronically. Or which is it again then? Isn't it's A8 is? of 23 or page 17 of the A8. air package. Okay. So if you go up, if you hit the. Hit what? If you hit the top, you can just go there. Well, here's eight. Okay. okay. Draft language and our design requirements the following apply access and mobility? That's correct. That's it. That's, that's about the alley? Right. Okay. So hit to keep going. You'll, there, you'll see study to. Okay. Study. That's yeah. where that is. Okay. And is it just to study A, B, and C? Is that the end of it? No. Keeps on going. It hits Drain. drainage, adjacent yeah. properties, design and construction. Yikes. So, so there's, just there's, to, I guess, the, I mean, it, I, I think, you know, Mike's comment that we don't need a study to do the alley. So I don't know where to start to change any of this. Do you have some ideas, Dale or JC? Well, I would, I would say we're going to have to probably, we're going to have to do some sort of study or process to decide um, any of the, A, there's probably something we have to decide about drainage, um, well, at least a, grading. Yeah. But that's an engineering thing, not a. So, and there's the issue of, does the county do it or do the people? No, change? I mean, I think we're clear about that part, but it's the scope. I see, so a part A, B, and C. Um, perhaps, JC started, uh, perhaps it might clarify the record, Mike, if you could t very specifically state what can be done from a design and engineering perspective now versus what the study might produce? Well, I guess to begin with, uh, we can merely say that uh, the alley shall be designed to facilitate drainage to not impact adjacent properties and a surface is to be created for multi-weather travel. Um, I think the decision point though, at some, it, it has to come to a point of, do we make a two-way or a one-way alley? And how do we determine that? And that's a decision that needs to be made at some point. It doesn't have to have a study, but it does have to have some sort of thought put into it. And it would be in, in concert with the commercial property owners and how that works. The, and the study, would the study affect what we were going to do? I mean, we have a 12 foot width. It's more a policy of how people are gonna drive on it, not a physical um, piece of it. Uh, I would note for the record that if we did a one-way alley, it's my understanding that we would need an egress point from the alley, which does not currently exist. So that would re require uh, the county obtaining an easement from those landowners, and I believe they're both, I believe the most logical area is two of the commercial landowners, um, an, a, an easement for the county, for the public, to use that as an egress from the alley. So I think that's one question that would uh, require us obviously interacting with the commercial owners on that versus a two-way alley, um, which would not necessarily need that. It would need the turnaround, though, and at some point. It would need the turnaround, yes. and the turnaround would have uh, similar requirements in terms of if it did happen to go onto any of the landowner's property, we would need a public easement through the county. Don't we, we have that easement now, do we not? For the turnaround, or would be different turnaround? 
We do not have that at this time. Okay. Um, so the decision on two-way versus one-way is that strictly once you get to X number of cars, all of a sudden we need to move from one to the other, or is it a policy decision based on preferences and more sub subjective qualitative items? I think it would be based more on the subjective and qualitative items. Um, again, that those are discussions that could take place, and if, as uh, uh, JC indicated, uh, we are unable to obtain the public easement, then a, a two-way alley configuration with a turnaround uh, near the end would need to be implemented uh, that also carries with it its own requirement for an easement of some sort. But you know, So we have a problem either way, right? If it's two-way, we need access out on the other end of the alley, and then if it's, excuse me, one way, if it's mm -hmm. two-way, you need a turnaround, which we don't have. There's private Correct. property Correct. on either side. And I, and I would note, I think, that there has been historic use of people turning around at the end of that alley. Um, I don't have personal knowledge of that, although I would assume that, but I think the turnaround would have to be built to meet our multi multimodal transportation standards, which would therefore increase what is probably the historical easement that is present. But there is no easement now? Not for a turnaround, no. I know somebody had turned around there. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, well, so it, it does seem, <clears throat> well, so in terms of the study, um, which is just A, B, and C, and you were right, and I was, um, I guess I'm not sure that I'm willing to be talked into it that we need a traffic study now. It does seem like it would be, in, be worth having a baseline traffic count and provisions in in con concert with the um, owners, the, the property owners and the residents of periodically checking those traffic counts to see if traffic again has reached impactful levels, safety and everything like that. Uh, but I'm not sure that we need a full traffic study now. So I guess one suggestion would be to get rid of that. But is there a problem that we do that since really our, the physical changes to the alley aren't contingent upon that? Yes, I would suggest maybe some language that indicated a study shall be performed uh, at some time in the future and that some time is, is up in the air to determine uh, additional uh, restrictions or changes to the use of the alley and the pedestrian features. But that's you know, that, that, again, that, that doesn't define anything. It doesn't say anything. So, no. you know, if we want to take out the, compl the, completely take out the need for a study, we can certainly do that and then just go toward design of the alley itself. But at some point, if, if there are issues or problems or concerns, we need to evaluate that and quantify it. I guess I'm, I'm thinking of, is there a trigger that would cause us to to look at doing additional study, either through traffic counts or just, you know, taking it up with the NIWAT community, whether or not the traffic is, you know, at some point in three years and five years, reassess whether or not the use of the alley is working as planned or if additional mitigation measures need to be required. I think the trigger of time would be most beneficial time versus activity versus activity yes because activity can be uh, unrelated to uh, specific growth it could be just a particular point in time where activity is high for some reason uh, but that should not trigger necessarily any long-term improvements so if a, a restudy similar to the parking study which is done every two to three years, uh, we can have a, a similar time frame put on studying traffic movements in this area relative to the alley. So, so what happens if somebody comes in with and wants to use the alley under these rules after we pass them? Do we just let them use the alley? How, how does that work? I, I'm afraid, I don't want to put this thing off and have it just kind of being hanging mm -hmm. out there. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I J think people JC need to have certainty around it. JC has an answer to that, I think. Well, I think it's important to look at um, under the physical dimensions part, which is three, and then travels onto the next page. We have, you know, one of the main issues is this kind of turnaround issue or one way or two way, and we have in C. Uh, one and two, that turnaround may take place on existing parking areas with associated easement and pullouts may be aggregated for multiple properties. I believe that that section of the proposed code was included in order to help development proposals that come in in the near term have a way of moving forward with using the alley um, without going through full improvement of the alley. So I believe, and Mike can expound on this further, that there are ways that we can allow development proposals to come in, and as long as they're made, they're meeting the basic physical uh, and drainage um, requirements as set forth in the proposed language, then those can, those can move through into using the alley in a way that we would be comfortable with in terms of transportation requirements. So does that mean that <clears throat> somebody would come in and improve their section of the alley? Or did they do a minimum for the whole alley? I don't, that's the problem we had before. Mm -hmm. So how does that work? I mean, there is potential for that. I think there's, there, if you're at the very end of the alley, then there might be more requirements for the length of the alley than if you happen to come in early or mid. Um, I could see a, a development proposal coming in for midway section through the alley uh, with a parking lot that has enough space for a turnaround upon it already uh, and only requiring minimal grading and drainage requirements for the alley. If I may, something that uh, we require traffic studies with any individual development anyway. And so as we evaluate those, that can help determine and, and uh, speak to what additional improvements, if any, are needed. But uh, overall, you know, the, those, those studies are required anyway. Uh, as part of individual site development. So we can use those to help inform us. But we do we do have requirements for off-site improvements, uh, as I stated earlier, uh, for developments elsewhere in the county. If a property owner develops a site, um, there are uh, requirements up to that site that make the, the route safer, then we do require that from them. So, JC, are you suggesting that if we could just take out two I, double I, A, B, and C for the study and leave everything else, we'd probably be okay? That might be a question that's better answered by Dale and okay. Mike, but that is my understanding. I'll, however, I think that Mike did point out that in terms of the study, we might want to replace A, B, and C with the language that states that the improvements to the study will be, or improvements to the alley will be studied every two or three years. And I guess the, the should there be some process with neighbors and business owners to actually think through how this is implemented? And I think that the, the we have received comments proposing a process. Um, so I'm just trying to figure out how, how would we incorporate that um, sentiment in here in terms of process. Dale, do you have thoughts on the best way to move forward with that piece of it? Yeah, Dale Kiss, land use. Uh, we talked about this uh, over the last few days uh, of trying to figure out how to move forward because it, we feel it, you know, you have the words and what's required, but there's a lot of there's a lot at stake for the folks who live along the alley and for the commercial property owners. And so, trying to get a process where we can get folks together now that once we have this decided, and come up with how that how how this unfolds, uh, that we think it'd be best to do it sooner rather than later, um, and to do it on a more frequent basis, um, and which may be some daytime meetings to make it work for folks and maybe some evenings, but try to pick a date, and I, we didn't come up with one today yet, but starting probably in mid-May and even have something bi-weekly or even weekly in certain instances where we can keep it, keep the momentum, keep some ideas for what people want to see, what the design pieces are, ideas for paying for it, and 
what can happen when. So we're thinking, we're hoping mid-May we could get something going. And so I think that that's great to move quickly to include the business owners and the residents, um, as well as other community members that, that are interested in the best interest of the community but may not have an adjacent vested interest in you know, that block area. I guess the question is, in terms of words included here tonight, does I, there need to be something about the process in here, or can I, we just acknowledge? I think acknowledge... you can direct staff to, okay. to do that, um, and we don't need it in the code, because once that's done, that code language would become out of date anyway, so it's kind of nice if we get that direction separately. Okay. And I, and one of the other issues I think that, that we've discussed along that that we want to consider is the pedestrian ways through some of these business properties to Second Avenue. People do it all the time now as part of that design review, as part of site plan review, how do we connect the alley to Second Avenue, not only for cars and vehicles, but for pedestrians. And that's gonna be take working with those commercial property owners through that process as well. So I think that's a good idea. <clears throat> Just given the situation that we have, uh, I will observe that we are kind of pushing it back at staff again to do some of this work. Uh, and so I would try to come to some agreement, uh, consent, whatever, fairly quickly uh, and not keep dragging this out because we don't want staff doing that and we don't want the public getting worn out either. So uh, do that fairly quickly. And it seems to me like we're, and I'm hoping we're not uh, putting this off to site plan review, which could have its issues as well. But that's just an observation. But I do think you're, uh, at least what you were suggesting, and uh, it's a good idea. So the sentiment you just mentioned about pedestrian access between the Alley and 2nd Avenue is part of the um, paragraph 5F. So again, I'm just, if we take out the study, which is 2A, B, and C, and replace it with periodic review, um, and we're gonna have to draft on the fly, I think, but something to the effect of, and Dale, I'm looking at you because I, I'm thinking the parking process is a good model to follow, um, th that um, traffic counts will, and public input will be periodically, or let's decide every, you know, two years or what, I don't know if it has to be ongoing or just initially as we start off um, be assessed to determine if additional traffic mitigation is needed in order to assure safety. So I think we'd want an initial study and count that we'd put in there. And then I think you could word something along the lines and within six months or a year, something like that, after the first new development project receives final inspection approval, subsequent traffic counts will be taken and help um, help inform the study and maybe do that as based on the, the, the developments that happen. Look at those studies after they happen after after those developments happen and have traffic counts built on the timing of that. Because I'm worried that if we say oh in a year three years, if nothing happens out there, if nothing redevelops in that period, then we're spending money doing counts yeah, for, for no that. reason. So making it contingent on on, on change occurring. So, so make, who's, makes sense who's doing the study? Us? Well, I'm just, I'm wondering if a simple traffic count initially, and again, I'm thinking, you know, we put the little things across the, the road yeah. ourselves. Is that true? Does that work? So we have a baseline traffic count. Yes, we can. We just to get a baseline count is is a simple activity. We can go ahead and do it. So I guess then I would replace. I would suggest replacing the study se uh, section with A, which is an initial traffic count will be conducted by the county, and then B. Um, going to Dale, adding Dale's language with when, uh, within one year after the first new development. 
your language was it receives final occupancy um, there's inspection. certificate of occupancy um, a, a new traffic count will be conducted and I guess I would like to go back to the neighbors and add to that and um, a survey public input however what's the best way to do that to see if it's working for the, the residents as well as the property owners to see if additional mitigation measures are needed. Do you propose that the um, traffic count and public input survey each year after a development occurs will be conducted by the county? Yeah. yeah. I, I was. I wasn't thinking it had to happen every year. I think do it one year and then is it possible I'm looking at you, Dale. How often do we need to do it after that? Um, or do you? can we determine at that point if we need additional? It's as development happens over time, if the traffic gets worse, so. Yeah, and maybe we could add language and evaluate it to see if additional studies would, and counts would be required on some interim basis and give us that flexibility to do that. Uh, the question is whether you want this to come back to you at that time to review and evaluate sort of the findings or whether it's working, staff working with the property owners and residents to look at mitigation measures and just going forward and trying to implement them. So you know, I'm going back, <clears throat> excuse me, to my old trail design days. The traffic counts, visitor counts nice, but what you need is, is a design and build. You need to figure out what you're gonna do with this Thing. And, and if you leave it like it is, you're going to have problems, and I don't want to get in this situation where we're rolling around. So We're just talking about the study portion and then the rest of it, the physical dimensions, how it would be the drainage, need, adjacent properties, right. designing construction would stay as All is. that stays But in you it. need that info to do that. Yeah. You need to do A to do B. That's, that's the thing. And I don't know if there's levels of studies or not. Maybe that's a way to handle this. Well, so that's the, the, the thing we were trying to, to wrestle to the ground. Do we actually need a traffic count to know that the, that the alley needs to be constructed to a certain dimension? No. Doesn't sound like we do. And I, I think that's the, that is the, the question. I, don't, I think that if you keep the other pieces, the physical dimensions and criteria, that's, that's the minimum that's going to be required now for somebody to come to do to bring the alley up to the level to be able to utilize it and then based on the studies and so forth there may be maybe less requirements as far as width or something like that on future developments or more like it, it could impact some of this for code change but it would be able to move forward with with these physical things without the study this these physical pieces are what's required now drainage width turnarounds and I would note that this, this is a similar process to if someone came in for a site plan review for a house in the mountains, we would require them to receive an access permit off of a county right of way. We would require them to do a drainage plan. We would require them to um, meet transportation standards for off-site road improvements if necessary. And we would require specifics in terms of the engineering and design of their driveway. Is that correct? That is correct. So all of that is in here. Yeah. And these are just those standards that we'd be applying in this case. Yeah, okay. right. So when those people come in, do they need to do a study beforehand to do all that, or do they just do it to give it to you? And how do you do it if there's one applicant on a long alley? The same way that we do it with an applicant on one of our long mountain roads that requires updates for the mountain, for the multimodal transportation standards. Okay. But in this particular case, the idea is to direct staff outside of the words on this to conduct a process immediately with the business owners and the residents to figure out the details of, for example, you know, what kind of um, buffer uh, vegetation and fencing we, we would put in for the neighbors, that kind of thing. Correct? So we would be deciding that immediately up front Would you like to put language into, and it could be the study section, would you like to put language into the process? For example, staff must meet with um, property owners within and 
all the property owners with and uh, interested residents within a certain time period? Well, I think we asked that to Dale, and he suggested that we give that very specific direction to staff outside of the words on this paper okay. so that it wouldn't be, so it's not locked into this document, because we'll, this, then I think that makes sense. So we need to pick up the pace because um, my concern with that is we're going to have a public process that's going to come back and say you need to do a study, and it's going to just take more time. Uh, to me, maybe a better way to go is to have a a study of lesser degree. I don't know. Uh, but I think but, that you're right. That's what we're trying to do, and the the part that we were suggesting wouldn't be as necessary, and that could cost as much as $50,000, which is money we'd rather the property owners put into actually physical uh, improvements to the alley, is traffic volumes, daily volumes, peak hours, weekend variations, crashes. That that piece wouldn't be necessary to begin work on the alley. And that the process we're directing staff to undertake with the residents and property owners would be to figure out, um, again, sort of the site-specific improvements that we want to make uh, to buffer this from the, the residents. Did you want a time period for when that initial traffic count needs to take place in? Um, sure, we, it seems like it, it, within X number of months of adoption, I mean, you you want to do it now, mm -hmm. so as to be, provide a baseline before any improvements are made. Yes. Yes. So time sometime within the next six months. I think six months is more than adequate. Three months? What do you tell us? We'll call it three months. Three I months. Think three months. Is good. Who's keeping track of our of our language here? I am writing it down. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank, thank you. you. So it's six months to do. Three months. Uh, three months to do a traffic study and meet with the with the neighbors. No. That, so an initial traffic count will be conducted by the county within three months. Uh, the meeting, the process meeting, is directed towards staff for taking place without specific language in the code because at some point it may not become relevant and necessary, and therefore it would be obsolete code language, which we would like to avoid. Uh, and then the next part would be within one year after the first development receives a certificate of occupancy, a new traffic count and public input survey will be conducted by the county to de determine if additional counts and surveys will be required in the future and any additional improvements or changes to the alley design. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think that's great. And you had asked whether or not this needs to come back to the, for, to the board or whether or not staff can just deal with that I'm sorry, did you say that there was going to be some public input associated with that? Again, we need to know if people are feeling their safety issues. It was my understanding that after the first development receives a certificate of occupancy, that when we do the new traffic count, we would also do a public input yep. survey. Yes, okay, yep. great. So let me understand this. So you, you do, before you do first, this is a, so, so an applicant comes in, they do a site review, you figure out what has to happen to the alley. So, so no, <laughs> right now, before anybody comes in for site plan review, transportation is going to do an, an, uh, a traffic count. So we're going to have a baseline. And Dale is going to meet with the property owners and the residents now to put together sort of the, the game plan for moving forward with alley improvements. Then somebody might be coming in for a site plan at any point and continue with your question. And they will be subject to everything that we require anyway within a site plan review, which is a traffic study, a drainage study, um, off-site road improvements if necessary. All of those factors are already a part of that. The physical improvements and the part of the proposed amendments that we have in the code are specific to for alleys, since we don't have specific language to alleys in the current multimodal transportation standards. So it would be a similar process if we had an off-site road for a house that was coming in, would be requiring them to meet those, those multimodal transportation standards. Because we don't have specific alley design guidelines in the MMTS, the code is providing those guidelines here in terms of the physical, and physical and engineering requirements, and they will have to bring in development proposals that meet those requirements. 
And JC, you have in there to take out E.1.A.2 study. So are you uh, y yes. I, I, yes. Yes. So then we would take out under the draft language E1A2 and add in those two other points that I had previously made. Yep. Sorry. And add in the two points that I had previously made. So an A, an initial traffic count will be conducted by the county within three months, and B, within one year after the first development receives a certificate of occupancy. A new traffic count and public input survey will be conducted by the county to determine if additional counts and surveys will be required in the future and any additional improvements or changes to DALI design. Could you could add the words safety mitigation? Just additional in, improvements or changes, or where do you want safety mitigation? Um, improvements, comma, safety mitigation, comma, and then whatever else you have. So that strikes the section mm -hmm. II paren study, that yes. whole section? Yep. So. so then did you have some stuff around lighting? And I just want to just check with staff, does that hold together for you all? Okay. And then Dale, uh, again, I was just trying to simplify without taking away explicit mention or the goal of, of reducing impact on the neighbors. Um, happy to receive any recommendations. Boy, we're losing our crowd quickly. <laughs> and that was on both window placement, the second story patio issue, and the lighting issue? What, what, or, what page was, are we on? Um, patio and window placing and placement. Um, I think we are on, oh crap, where did it go? A10 of 23. 10. And it starts with outdoor lighting. Building form on the 11. So it really goes on to 11. So on, uh, on lighting, I was uh, I hadn't brought up light, lighting, but you had, but whether or not this is any different than, or how does this differ from our lighting ordinance for everywhere else? Or is it just restating? So it does under the lighting under D, the second floor entrances requiring lighting should be situated such that it's not visible to adjacent areas in the NRCD2 or RR. That's, that's not in our current lighting code, so that's additional to try to protect that kind of view of people from the lighting that might be on exterior stairwells that go up to uh, second floors in the commercial district. Um, the lighting operation hours, um, it's just saying that we could institute some restrictions as far as hours of operation. We do that now through site plan review or special review on different um, dockets, and it just makes folks aware that that is something that that we could do based on the for the use that they're they're asking for. Uh, it helps not only with the light pollution, but if we restrict hours of lighting, it helps with energy use and so forth, so. I didn't actually have a problem with the lighting. It's, most of it, I think, is talking about sort of status quo with the exception of and the second floor lighting, which e. I don't find that onerous, and we don't want people's mm -mm. light flowing into the residents' windows, so. So it's just under building form where the questions were then? So it was right. under the windows and the patios. I, yeah. And again, I was just trying to simplify. Yeah. And simplify by being less specific, is that yep. the intent? Okay. Mm -hmm. So just for clarification, we're leaving the outdoor lighting section as it is. I guess yeah. I, I hadn't brought up cha making changes yeah. to it, so. I was conflating window lighting and lighting. Okay. 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 So, I mean, we could just. So we're on. On, on building form, on C and D window placement and second story patios. Those were the two. What page? Two pieces. Uh, A11. Page I have in front of me is A11 of 23 in attachment A. So it's attachment A. It's number six under building form. Um, so six building form, C and D are uh, the language that was added to for today's hearing. 
and we could combine that into um, you know attempt sh attempt shall be should be made to just the word the word should be minimized to preserve privacy of property zoned residential I think is a catchphrase and so mm -hmm. window placement second story windows should be designed to minimize or uh, should be designed to preserve the privacy of properties zoned residential or something like that yeah I think that's say say, say yeah. that it's so it says right now it says should be minimized so there's a there's waffle language in there already there's but I, I think the getting rid of the amount of window area should be minimized to preserve privacy you I was just I'm trying to throw a bone to the folks who felt like um, there was a lot more detail than necessary yeah, the goal is to protect the re the neighbors we don't have anything against windows so however they accomplish right. that right. is fine you're right that it's wiggle language I was trying to um, make to simplify it with by just making it more performance rather than more the performance and st it would still allow windows right you know sort of a normal amount of windows on that side that so for section C uh, switching that language to second story windows should be designed to preserve privacy of property zoned residential and I would just add windows and outdoor patios or decks or something yeah like that. then we could just combine and, just one, and then we have one and it's all there and we look yeah, at that nice. through the site plan review process Okay. And I guess in C and D, you refer to the neighbors in two different ways. I'm not sure which one is better: adjacent property zoned and RDC two or RR versus property zoned residential. So I, I'd prefer to be the more specific there of the NRCD two or RR, and that way it applies to any of the residential properties that border any of the commercial properties. Not I just think that the that makes sense. Five, so. Be more specific. Okay, so then that takes us to the FAR discussion. And I guess, I mean, I'll just say I'm fine with the staff recommendation because it feels to me like it gets to where we need to be. And I guess I am too. I, I certainly respect and hear your concerns, Matt. I just think that given the constraints associated with using the incentives to actually get to point seven and site plan reviews protections that while this chart gives us the maximum possible that that's not going to be the reality for the whole district so this is sort of maximum potential but it's that's more mathematical than what we're going to see on the ground and based on that and trying to strike the compromise um, I, I think I would be willing to go with the staff recommendation as well. I appreciate that. My concern is that what's going to happen in the site plan review, based on what's happened before, is we're going to wrestle this thing back towards six. Why not just start at six five and not have the wrestling match? But I can get votes. Yeah, I mean, and I think the when the letter that we'd gotten from the commercial owners. I think they were proposing 0.82 and um, which I think the compromise with incentives to 0.7 um, feels like worthwhile okay Are, do we think we're there anything else well so I, I guess I'm in, the, in that same situation and I guess um, it if you feel strongly and, and we could vote on motions to, um, if you want to vote on that particular piece or if we can just move to putting together a motion for the whole kit and caboodle so I know how the motion is going to go so um, I'm not going to make the motion but um, when I'm in here and you guys are gone and we're wrestling with this I'm going to invite you back just saying anyway well I my brief experience being a commissioner over um, NIWAT related issues is they're always good with public engagement no matter what so <laughs> I'm not sure if you put it at 6.6 .6, you wouldn't still get a whole lot of folks um, 
coming at site plan review because they care about their community and they want to make sure that it's perfect. So I hear what you're saying. So I'm not going to make a motion on FAR and I'm ready to wrap it up. How's that? I'm sorry. I'm not going to make a motion. Okay. 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 Six point then, five. Do you need any further clarification on the language that you want? We Anything? trust that you okay. have we gotten you've it. You've got it. Okay. Um, so I will make a motion to approve docket DC-18-0004 amendments to the Niwot Rural Community District Article 4-16 and related land use code provisions with the changes that we have outlined and JC has captured and also including the direction to staff to work with the residents and commercial property owners uh, as soon as possible around the alley. And I think that's the only things I needed to say out loud. Works for me, second. So we have a motion and a second. I'll stop and make sure that staff feel like they have understood the guidance and direction. And could I, I should have right, so I should have said this earlier. I, I appreciate everybody participating in this. I know it's a lot of work and um, and there nobody's coming out with everything they want. But I appreciate that people have the spirit to work on this issue together to try to come to an outcome that works. Well said. So we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you everyone. Thanks.